Welcome to uh, today's EML seminar. I'm Sigurd Wagner of Princeton University. I'm the discussion leader, and we'll start with an informal uh, interview with Stephanie Lacour, who is uh, a professor at the APFL in, in Lausanne, and who is today's uh, uh, webinar speaker. Stephanie, uh, can you go through, you are, dealing with blood seen from an electrical engineer. Uh, how can an electrical engineer that you are get used to dealing with blood? Can you describe your professional development that way? Okay. So, um, all right, that's an interesting question. Um, so the, I've always been interested in, in um, medicine, to so, but uh, life has made that I chose uh, electrical engineering as a first training. And so in one way, I always try to steer back to some um, medical content in the work, in my work. And um, so how did I get to do, working really on the neuroprosthetics? Um, I think it's uh, through opportunities, really, and uh, meeting uh, people like you, like uh, many of the, the people who are here on this call, to uh, get inspiration and start uh, bridging basically disciplines. Um, so I don't know, do you, do you want me to say more, more, more details on the curriculum or? Well, did you, uh, <clears throat> you went to the, uh, uh, the uh, Engineering University of Applied Sciences in Lyon. Mm -hmm. uh, and there you, if I remember, you did a PhD thesis that was a microcrystalline or porous silicon Correct. Uh, for, for some measurement on blood. Right, uh, so there, yes. So my training was already in more on the material science side and, uh, and device side, so how to, and, and microfabrication. And the goal of the thesis was to, um, to measure skin hydration so skin has always been a uh, fil rouge across my uh, training. Uh, but, um, and we were using actually, so to measure skin hydration, we were measuring basically thermal transfer property or uh, thermal, thermal conductivity through skin tissue. And this is uh, modulated through the, the blood flow. And so that's how we, uh, we could, uh, through uh, the design of a surface, skin sensor, which at the time was done entirely with silicon technology, so rigid technology, we could actually measure uh, by maintaining a constant temperature across a particular region of the skin, where we could compute the thermal conductivity of the skin through uh, the power we, we needed to maintain a constant temperature across that zone. And so that's how I start. actually, so that even that in that project, I was already at the interface between devices or implementation of devices into a physiological measurement or electrophysiological measurement. So that was bioelectronics already? Already, yes. But actually, very interestingly, the group at the time I joined was already had a, a prototype sensor with simple, simple thermocouple using polyimide as a carrier material. And the purpose of my PhD was actually to transfer that flexible device into silicon, so onto something rigid. But there, the, uh, the idea was to actually implement microfabrication and miniaturization, which at the time was not so straightforward in, in plastics. And then I discovered that world when I moved to your lab in, in Princeton on how to machine and uh, manipulate material on, on, on a polymeric substrate. Yeah, but actually, you. Uh... Uh, initiated the, the bio aspect uh, uh, of that by collaborating with, you initiated the collaboration with Barclay Morrison, mm -hmm. who, by the way, begs your pardon, he is in the, on several planning committees of Columbia for the, the lockdown. And, okay. and uh, so he's booked out, yeah. Uh, Anyways, okay. you, that, I remember very well, you gave a seminar at Columbia uh, and then you talked with him, and then you got interested in in, uh, in neuro actually in neural uh, neuroscience applications. Yes, correct. This is one of those uh, seize the moment opportunity, right? Because indeed, when uh, after the seminar, Barclay and I had a, a, a discussion because he's studying trauma. For those who don't know Barclay Morrison, he's a professor who's uh, one of the 
field of, one of his field of research is uh, understanding traumatic brain injury. And in particular, in his lab, he has a model of uh, in vitro, um, uh, an in vitro model to actually stretch uh, mechanically the brain slices in order to understand the uh, aftermath or the consequences of traumatic injury, mechanical injury to, uh, to neural tissue. And by talking with him, it turns out that at the time he was seeding some of those uh, brain tissue on silicone membrane, which were very, very similar to the silicone membrane we were actually using to develop our soft um, electrode. Yeah. And that's how the two things got together. That's silicone with an E at the end. <laughs> A silicone with an E at the end, correct. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then you uh, went to Cambridge. <laughs> Uh, and steered yourself uh, into, again, uh, a bioelectronic area, uh, which was enabled because you got that five-year Royal Society Fellowship that let you be independent, uh, conduct independent research, right? Correct. So what did you get engaged in at Cambridge? So at Cambridge, I, I, uh, I got involved in uh, more... Um, so we, in Princeton and with Barclay Morrison at Columbia, we worked on in vitro interfaces. Whereas when I moved to Cambridge, we started exploring how to use devices in vivo. And so I, I worked with uh, several groups, but in particular, the group of James Fawcett, uh, and uh, who is leading the, the Center for Brain Repair in Cambridge. And together we spent several years looking at and designing an implant to promote nerve regeneration and record and stimulate uh, uh, nerves that are uh, uh, regenerating. And uh, through this collaboration, I learned a lot about neuroscience, about some of the challenges to actually implement concept that we have on the device side and implement it in, in vivo. And what does it mean to actually conduct uh, uh, animal research? I want to... Uh... Just interrupt quickly. I want to introduce Kuo Song Hong of Stanford. Hi, Kuo Song. Hi, Hi Professor Hi. Wagner. Very nice to meet you. And Hi. also Chim Jia from Singapore, who does uh, incredible lifestyle because he's always on at midnight. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sigurd. Uh, nice to see you. Yep. Thank you, uh, Stephanie. Hi, nice, nice to see you. <laughs> also, Sigurd and uh, Stephanie, I want to introduce some of the panelists. Uh, Professor Su Lin Zhang from Penn State University. Su Lin can wave. <laughs> Su Lin is also uh, one of the editors of the EML. So Stephanie, continue before we have a, a couple of minutes left. Now you're in Cambridge. Okay, um, so I stayed there for a few, uh, yes, a few years. And really the key there, it was, uh, that's where I, I realized that, that there was a really a lot of application and a lot of opportunity to develop novel devices for neural application. And uh, one thing that has always motivated me as well is also exploring the, the therapeutical application. So not uh, just designing the device for the devices, but see how far we can actually take the novel concept that we have in the lab and, and explore how we, they can be used to answer needs in the medical context. And that's also then the transition to EPFL, uh, where I found an environment that was really, that is really uh, interdisciplinary and promoting this type of, uh, of collaboration between the life sciences and engineering. That almost leads into your seminar title now. Almost. Uh, well, before we start, uh, uh, Jimmy Shah wants to uh, say a few words. Please, Jimmy, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have uh, one slide I want to show you. Let me share my screen. Mm. Hmm. For some reason, I'm disabled. You're, you have to be friends with Tang Li to get... Tang, <laughs> uh, please make me friend. <laughs> okay, let me try again. All right. Um, Mm -hmm. 
just one slide I want to show you. Uh, so this is uh, Extreme Mechanics Letters webinar series, EML webinar series. And Extreme Mechanics Letters is a relatively young journal uh, edited by a, a very capable group of editors, uh, John Rogers, Zhi Gangsu, and myself, and uh, uh, Katia Bataldi from Harvard University, uh, Han Qingjiang from Arizona State, Tong Li from University of Maryland, Martin City from Max Planck, Su Lin Zhang from Penn State, and uh, Rebecca Kabun is our uh, Elsevier uh, publisher. I just want to highlight one thing. Uh, I'd like to bring to your attention uh, a short article published in Matter. So uh, even our, even though we're uh, EML seminar where we're promoting uh, matter articles. And it's published by Zhigang Suo. It's fascinating, it's a, it's, it, it's a must read. Uh, it's, the title of that is called To Read as Human, To Watch Divine Engineering EML Webinar. Uh, it's published uh, last week. And it's actually published in the section in matter called matter of opinion. So please read that. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm turning it back to a figure. Yeah, so it's exactly uh, 10 o'clock here in the East Coast. Uh, I think it's time to start the uh, webinar. Uh, the uh, webinar will be given by Professor Stephanie Lacour from the Ecole Polytechnique Federale in Lausanne to the EPFL, as it is more commonly known. The talk is uh, from engineering elasticity to neural implants for translational research. And before we start the talk, uh, I want to quickly mention that I am the discussion leader. I'm Sigurd Wagner uh, of Princeton University. Uh, and uh, then go quickly through uh, 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 Stephanie's career. She, uh, Professor Lacour, uh, he has a chair uh, that is the Berta Reilly Foundation Chair in Neuroprosthetic Technology uh, at the Engineering School of EPFL in Lausanne. And her own laboratory is uh, the Laboratory on Soft Bio Bioelectronic Interfaces. And it is part of EPFL Center of Neuroprosthetics. Now it turns out I'll return briefly to that at the end. Uh, the Center of Neuropros for Neuroprosthetics is in a hired in center. This is my uh, <laughs> awkward word for a center that's built uh, by declaring the purpose of the center and then hiring in faculty uh, that want to participate in the center. Uh, I'll get back to that at the end, but first uh, uh, describe briefly uh, Stephanie Lacour's career. She had an engineering PhD, electrical engineering from uh, the, uh, the a, a university, a technical university in Lyon, uh, the University for Applied Sciences, uh, where she worked uh, with uh, uh, nanoporous silicon for blood flow monitoring, and that set her on a dual career of engineering and biology. Then she went to a, uh, on a postdoc to Princeton, actually into my lab, where uh, uh, at a time when uh, we were uh, exper experimenting with the transition between flexible and possibly stretchable electronics. And Stephanie made the key discovery in the field, in my opinion, she discovered that when you put metal on an elastomer, you can stretch it not just by flattening waves in the metal, you can stretch it, the metal beyond flat. And we were so lucky that we had Jigang Suo and Tang Li uh, just on the hallway at that time, because otherwise you know, we, we just had no idea what was going on. You know, the, you can imagine it's, it's highly implausible what happens uh, there and th this collaboration was very important 
for our group and also for Stephanie's further career. She uh, it was an exciting discovery. Stephanie went to uh, give a number of seminars uh, in the US and at a seminar in bioengineering in Colombia, uh, she got into, as a consequence, into a collaboration with uh, uh, Barclay Boris Morrison in Colombia, who is a uh, part of his program uh, is testing uh, brain slices for a traumatic injury. So that led to a, a research collaboration. Stephanie then went to the University of Cambridge where she stayed with flexible bioelectronics and engaged into a collaboration that was closer to clinical application. Uh, uh, and then when uh, she uh, got to Lausanne, uh, I should say uh, uh, through a series as an assistant professor and she got through a number of express promotions as I would call uh, because of the program she started. And I also think because of her considerable managerial capabilities, which can be a burden, Stephanie, as you know, to be a good manager. <laughs> and uh, she uh, uh, is uh, the director. So in addition of running her own lab, she's the director of, of the uh, Center for Neuroprosthetics, which has currently 12 principal investigators. And as I mentioned, I admire the school very much because not many schools in the world have been able to do this, to start the center and, and bring in people who are dedicated uh, to, to the uh, program instead of convincing one existing colleague after another to collaborate with you. Uh, uh, they are brought in as collaborators already. So I think this is a very powerful a very expensive, but also very powerful way of, uh, of getting this field started, which is highly interdisciplinary, a very uh, materials oriented in another way, but uh, on, the, on one side, and it stretches all the way to uh, being able to deal with clinical researchers. Uh, so uh, anybody who has been in this, realizes that the languages in these fields and several stages in the field are different. So you have to learn a whole vocabulary. It's like a classical scholar who has to know Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, everything. Otherwise they can't do their work. And here you need several languages just to uh, uh, make the collaboration working. Stephanie, I admire for you for that. And please, uh, at the end of my talk, please go ahead. Thank you. Again, I think the talk is, from engineering elasticity to neural implants for translational research. Thank you very much, Sigurd. So I will I will share um, my screen. So first of all, um, yes, thank you very much uh, to all of you, Jigang, um, Tang, in particular Sigurd, um, for inv inviting me to give this uh, this seminar. I, it's I'm very pleased to, uh, to, to have this reunion as well as we, as uh, Sigurd mentioned, you know, I, we had a super uh, exciting time uh, back in Princeton when the four of us were in the EQUAD and uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to share some of our recent results uh, today with all of you, but you'll see that the work we had done at the time is still very much a, a fundamental aspect of the research I'm currently conducting. So <clears throat> my talk will, um, is uh, indeed entitled From Engineering Elasticity to Neural Implant from Translational Research. And um, uh, here you have a photograph of um, uh, the building where we actually are currently homed. So we are EPFL, but this is just as a side note, we are in, located not, not in Lausanne, but in Geneva. Geneva has, um, EPFL has now multiple sites. Um, and um, one of them is in Geneva and is uh, focused on um, um, translational research and uh, neural, te neural technology in particular. And this is the home for our Center for Neuroprosthetic. And uh, one particular aspect here that uh, we have in, the, in this campus, we have multiple buildings, but here the one you see on the, on the, on the picture 
um, for me, is important because within one building, we have actually several of the steps mandatory to conduct neuroprosthetic research. So on the first floor here, we, or second floor in the US, we have um, um, the technology floor, the clean room, and, and my lab in particular. The floor above, we have um, animal experimentation. The floor above, we have robotics. And then in the next building, we have uh, several facilities for uh, human uh, research. And so that's, uh, I think, a pretty unique, but yet mandatory environment if you want to do a translational research in particular in the field of neuroprosthetic. So the, um, um, so now I've lost control of everything here. Um, the, so the, the, the context as you, as you may have gathered then of the research we're conducting in the team is what we call neuroprosthetic medicine. And this is really one of the, key or important um, medical environment that is emerging in, in our century. And this is due to multiple reasons. We have lots of novel technology that are being developed and, and implemented. We can image the brain at very high resolution. We can really track connections between the, um, uh, the various uh, neural cells, but we can also listen to neural cells using uh, using devices and we can modulate activity of the nervous system. So all of these uh, advanced technology are now we're at the corner, um, uh, at, at the cornerstone to uh, really explore how we can implement technology, get inspired from the nervous system as well to derive novel technology, use uh, um, more uh, modern techniques like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, etc. Combine these to actually build novel tools and system that will help us diagnose, replace, or restore function that is damaged over time. And uh, aging is one particular important uh, um, uh, domain in the, in the uh, up upcoming century. And I think finding ways to actually help us age healthy is, a, is, is, is one aspect that where neuroprosthetic uh, medicine, for example, can, uh, can contribute a lot. So there's a lot of application for neuroprosthetic medicine, whether you have motor, sensory or cognitive um, impairments. But the one that are the most um, well known, I would say, are those two examples. And here I, I just uh, uh, give you an overview of the, um, uh, the nervous system, which is com composed of uh, the brain, the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. And then two of the uh, neuroprosthetic system you can find at the clinic are here. It's the cochlear implant or the deep brain stimulation. The cochlear implant is a device that is, consti that is constituted of an implantable electrode. This is this, um, the photograph that you see here. This is a, a snail-like structure. The electrodes are these little dots that are distributed along the, um, the, the shaft of the, of the electrode and it's inserted in the cochlea. And the purpose of this electrode um, array is to actually deliver electrical pulses at the right time uh, to, restore, to help restore audition in patients who are deaf. So they, they, you use electrical stimulation to actually uh, uh, mimic or replace, substitute uh, one of the fun a function of one of the critical cells in hearing, which are the hearing cells, which in case of uh, deaf people is actually either non-existent or have been damaged. And so that's one part of the, of the implantable system. So you have the electrode. Here you, you, you see that actually mechanical compliance is important already in, the, in this uh, technique because the cochlea here is, um, is very small and uh, highly curved. But then another important aspect of the, of the prosthesis is the, the lead, the cable that then goes to the electronic hardware that is um, a speech processor that converts sound into actually the stream of um, electrical pulses that is delivered to the cochlear. So that's one, uh, one very uh, well-known um, um, uh, prosthesis. Sorry, I think I, I should, sorry, I'm, I think I clicked on the wrong key, here we go. Can you still see the, the yes. slides? Yeah, okay. Um, and then the other example is a deep brain stimulation. And this is uh, used in the context of Parkinson. Um, and this is a device that is inserted in a deep structure of the brain. So here you see the, um, the, uh, there is a, an electrode that is inserted into the subthalamus nucleus. So this is in really a deep structure. So this is several 
centimeter in length, the shaft that is inserted in the brain. But the principle is very similar to that of the cochlear implant. So at the tip you, of this shaft, you have a, a multiple electrodes that deliver electrical pulses to modulate neuronal activity. And this is used, so in the context, as I mentioned, of Parkinson's disease, where you then uh, have, um, uh, you use this stimulation to actually stop or block um, uh, motor dis uh, disorders like the tremor that is associated with Parkinson. And then similarly to the cochlear implant, the electrode is connected through a lead and the cable to an implantable pulse stimulator or IPG, implantable pulse generator that host the battery and some of the, electro the electronic hardware that actually is programmed to deliver the, the, uh, the implantation, the, uh, the, um, the, the pulses. So these are the devices that you find at the clinic today. If you look at the technology, they're actually fairly simple in terms of material choices and um, options for the overall design. It's primarily, if I speak mostly for the, uh, the electrode side, we're talking about metallic electrodes that are usually made of um, inert uh, metal like platinum and a casing and encapsulation made of, um, of silicone rubber. So in, in, in both cases, this would be the, the prime material that you use and that are uh, used to, to build the electrodes. The electronic is actually uh, encased into uh, a titanium casing. So the, this here you, you see in the uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the photograph. And this is currently the only technique, this titanium casing that is available to actually implant for a long time, so many years, active electronics in the body. So this is the only uh, regulatory approved system to, to have uh, uh, active electronic in the body. So the, it works well, many, many people have these devices. This is, by the way, the same design that a, a cardiac pacemaker uh, would, uh, would have. The big challenge we see, especially in the context of this talk, is that this type of uh, approach requires large volume and very stiff materials. And so this is not the best uh, uh, adapted design that one may have for, um, uh, for implantable electronics. So, what um, we, we, I would like now to, to look at is really to try and, and uh, l um, revisit what are the critical components that build these implantable or that consist of, uh, that form these uh, implantable neuroprosthetic system. And then look at the component and where we can actually have technological um, improvement or, and innovation to actually design the next generation of medical uh, uh, implants. So, in implantable system, first of all, you have to uh, consider that you have those three main components. The first one is, of course, the, the biological medium, which is the tissue you want to interface with. So whether you interrogate the tissue or whether you, so you write information in or you, you record information from. Then you have the transducer, which is the device, the part of your, of your system that will be in direct connection and direct interface with the biological tissue. So you can, again, either have a transducer designed to record or stimulate, and some system actually are, should or may be able to actually switch from one function to the other. So the, the transducer is, a, is the second important element. And then the third is, the, as I mentioned before, is the um, instrumentation uh, and the electronics and the associated, ultimately, telemetry um, that allows to have a fully implantable system. So when you design this system, uh, you actually have to go through several steps, and this will be recurrent in my talk. I'll try to show you how we actually go from the acute phase, which is the phase where you actually only it's intraoperative evaluation of, your, of, of the device. Then you have to go through short term. So this is usually a few weeks to a few months to lifelong use and validity of the, of the technology or reliability of the technology. Then you have preclinical versus uh, therapeutical use of the device. Preclinical means that you conduct the research in animal models. Therapeutical is that you select animal models that are actually where you're able to replicate um, some of the condition that you can sustain that are vi clearly visible in humans. So not all animal models are suitable to do therapeutical uh, prosthetic research. Um, and the electronics are already mentioned. So 
in terms of the, the challenges or what you need to consider when you develop the, or select the component of, of your neuroprosthetic system is selecting the modalities. So do you, do you want a system that record or stimulate? By the way, most of the clinical devices today are stimulation device. There's very few chronic, so long-term, uh, several years, um, system that allow to record neural information. And this is, uh, there are multiple reasons, we can talk about this uh, later on, but uh, most of the, uh, of the, of the clinical devices today are stimulation devices. The key question is which transducer do you, do you need to actually communicate with the nervous system and at which spatial and temporal resolution. So these are all questions that will guide you to actually design um, the, uh, the transducers. And finally, the, the, the key question, of course, is how integrated is the device and the technology that you're, you're designing to, uh, with the host biological tissue? So the question we're, we're exploring in my lab is how soft, how can soft and fin-fin based bioelectronic system provide new opportunity in neurotechnology? Because you have a, a quite a wide range of choices and options to build novel transducing system uh, uh, for biology, but the, the, we are exploring specifically where, which uh, the, the one built out of technology that are in fin-fin, so we deposit Fin layers, fin here means uh, structures that are less than a micron in thickness. And soft, this is a very relative term, depending on who you talk to, soft can mean a few pascal to a few megapascal. So here I'll try to show you where soft in the context of uh, neuro, uh, neural interfaces, uh, which, which sort of metric or which of range of, uh, of compliance and, and softness we're, we're, we're talking about. So the talk will be divided into three, uh, three sections. The first one, um, I want to, to share um, sort of our understanding of what is the topology and the dynamics of the central nervous system today. So these are information that are not easy to actually collect and gather, especially coming from an engineering background. And uh, here I'll share some of the, um, the, the sort of summary of the information we have gathered over the years in, in, in the lab. Then I'll uh, explain how we can engineer elasticity in materials that a priori are not deformable and how we can use this engineered elasticity to conform to the nervous system and form uh, more bio-integrated interfaces. And then I'll conclude in the, in the last part to sh and in sharing our efforts in translating this novel innovation, this innovation in soft neurotechnology to its clinical use of the devices. So first, let's talk about the topology and the dynamics of the central nervous system. So here I will only focus on central nervous system, which means the brain and the spinal cords. We, um, in the question, we can discuss on the peripheral nerves, but the data I'm showing here is, uh, is only on the brain or the spinal cord. So the first thing to, to look at is the sizes of the, of the tissue we need to interface with. And here, this is a photograph of a collection of brain across uh, various species of uh, mammals. And um, what is the reason I put this, this, this here is to show and illustrate how different a mouse brain is from a human brain. Okay, this is not uh, big news, but actually when you, you have to consider that the prime entry when you develop implantable technology is actually the rodent model. Right? So we have to start working with a brain that is extremely small, where ultimately you want to work with the brain of a human, which is actually several orders of magnitude bigger. Okay? So here I put some numbers uh, for um, the, the typical um, uh, dimension of, uh, of the brain uh, of these various animals. So in the rat, the, 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 the adult rat brain is really light. It's uh, about two grams. And the cortical surface that corresponds to the very surface of the, uh, of the surface of the brain, it's only six, meter, six centimeters square, so it's pretty small. Whereas if you go to the human brain, you will see that you have lots of folds and, uh, on the surface of the brain, and that actually reach out to an enormous cortical surface. So there's a very large surface area at the very surface of, uh, of, of, of the brain. So we have 
several orders of magnitude difference, which means that if you optimize something for the rat or the mouse brain, you may be actually this will have, this very device will actually be only useful for a very small portion of the brain. This may be uh, okay for some application, uh, but may not be relevant for others. So it's important to actually keep in mind that uh, sizes across species is, uh, is very different. Here in the middle, I put the, the, the numbers for the rhesus monkey brain, because this is an important animal model uh, for translational research in particular in, uh, in the neuroprosthetic domain where we explore sensory, motor or cognitive uh, dysfunction. So there we're somewhere in between where you have a cortical surface that is a hundred centimeters square. Then if we now look a little closer about that surface of the brain, again here, uh, this is a cartoon now of, the, of what we had in the previous slide and brain fo folding, which corresponds to how much of the surface of the, of the brain is hidden, basically from the um, first view of the, of the brain structure. So brain folding is increasing as you go up in the, um, in the uh, development of the animal ladder. And so humans have the highest uh, density of folding. Um, and most of actually the surface area of the, of, the, of the cortex is hidden into those sulcus in, and not directly accessible from the very surface of the, of the, of, of the brain. And so again, this is something you, you have to, to, uh, to know and understand what is the topology of your and the surface uh, and the geometry of the tissue that you want to interface with. And just to give you some numbers, this is an EM image of one of those sulcus. And you can see that uh, th this is uh, the, the radius of curvature of that uh, very surface, which is only three millimeters. So we're talking also very, very small potential bending radius uh, and curve and uh, if you want to, to do a, a conformal coating of the surface of the of the sulcus. And of course you have to ha if you think of devices that you want to position at the surface of the brain, you may have to have your device to withstand both positive and negative curvatures which in terms of the mechanical design will also pose all sorts of interesting challenges. So these are this is for the folding. This, this was for the brain. You can also look at the dimension and this is now another por portion of the brain. This is the brain stem. So it's a lower part of the, of the brain, also very important uh, uh, function. And here I just wanted to show you this, this image here. It's, um, it's a slice from a human brain, uh, brain stem and also giving you a range of, of numbers. So here a, ben, a, a radius of about three millimeter. This is the curvature of this surface, which is the surface here of uh, this uh, auditory um, cochlear nucleus. This is a portion, this is the first entry point of the auditory information when it leaves the peripheral nervous system. And so this is a, an important area, for example, in developing what is called auditory brainstem implant where um, patient uh, cannot benefit from a cochlear implant, but you want to place the, the device uh, at the surface of the brainstem instead. So you need to understand and know what's the curvature, what's the actual environment where you position your device. And here again, dimensions are very small in the context, and this is in the context of the human, so you can anticipate how small this type of, uh, of geometry are when we talk about rodent model. Now, if we look at the spinal cord, spinal cord is also um, uh, scale and dimension uh, are also very important on the spinal cord. And this is even more so because this here, what you're looking at um, is an MRI image of the rat spinal cord. So here you have the bones that are surrounding here on this image. And this is the actual spinal, spinal cord with the, its protective skin, the dura mater. And then inside you have the white and the gray matter. So here it's color coated, so uh, we can extract this information. So from the uh, MRI image, we can extract this uh, information and reconstruct along the, the entire spinal canal, the various shapes and geometry. And what you can see here, L's correspond to the different um, um, segments along, along the spinal cord. And you can see that in the case of the rat, for example, so this is a four millimeter scale you have quite some variation in the overall geometry of the, um, of the spinal tissue itself. So again, depending here, the important message is that you need to know where you want to position your device because the geometry is actually not a one size fits all. And of course, if you go up, if you change your animal model, so going from 
the rodent to the non-human primate to the human, you will see that also the shape and the geometry varies quite significantly. And so these are important message here is that the shape and the dimension of the spinal cord overall differs whether you're depending on which segment on the spinal cord you are and of course across species. So what you optimize in one case is may actually will need to be re-optimized when you change animal models or if you change location of your device along the spinal cord. So now this was for the geometry. Uh, now in terms of the intrinsic property of the of the um, of the central nervous system or the central neural tissue, um, well, we have what we call soft tissue. So typically materials that will be um, of the order of a few kilopascal um, in terms of um, elastic modulus. But as you can see from this graph, which is taken from this um, very good review um, on the uh, brain uh, biomechanics, you see that this, the, the, the property of the, this is a, the brain matter of the human brain is actually not entirely elastic. So we actually have very viscoelastic material as a whole, if you consider the, the human brain. Um, you have some hysteresis, you, the, the tissue responds differently, whether it's under tension or, or under compression. And also within the brain, you have both the white and the gray matter. And there are some differences also in the overall stiffness of the material, whether the, um, the, the white matter is actually tend to be a little stiffer than the, than the gray matter. So that's an uh, important also factor when you, that you need to consider when you want to um, uh, interface with the, with the brain. And now getting more into the brain, it's, it's actually very difficult to get accurate measurement or precise measurement of the, uh, of the elasticity or the elastic modulus of the, of the brain tissue, because um, ideally you want to be able to do this in vivo. Um, and there's one technique that uh, is emerging. It's now um, MR, elastography, and this is based on, uh, uh, MR, uh, so this is conducted in an MRI scanner. So you obtain this first image. This is a, 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 a section of the brain. So in blue, you have the uh, whole outer boundary of the, of the cortex, if you want. This, in, this outer ring here is the, is, um, is the, the skull. Um, and then in this technique, you can actually use um, um, a probe that you, you bring in proximity to the head that would then send a shear wave. And this will actually displace the tissue through, the, through the, the skull. And you can actually compute based on the MRI imaging, you can compute, compute what is called the elastogram. So that tells you the relative displacement of the brain tissue. And through that, oops, and through that you can uh, compute then the elasticity map. And the, 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 what is important here is that you, this is really highlighting that both the gray and the white matter are soft. They're all you know, in the kilopascal range. These are shear modulus. Uh, but they actually are very distinct also whether you consider the white or the gray matter. So, and the advantage of this measurement, although it's not uh, uh, with a very high resolution, uh, the geometrical resolution, you can actually have a, a measurement done in vivo. So that's, the, that's um, another important uh, metric. And finally, I'd like to uh, sort of stop, uh, conclude the tour on the, uh, this um, uh, mechanics of or topology of the, of the central nervous system is also to consider the, the dynamics. So actually di the dynamical response of the neural tissue is probably as or even more important than the actual softness of the tissue. Because when you position a device in the proximity or within the central nervous system, then this device will, has to, will have to withstand the motion that you see here on those, on those videos. What you see on the left, this micro motion, this is an MRI movie that is emphasized, so enhanced. So the movement, uh, the displacement that you see are actually a little uh, more than what uh, really happens. But the, here, this is to show you that the brain tissue is, is in constant motion. And this is simply motion induced through breathing and cardiac rhythm. So that's the blood flow pulsation and the, the, the natural uh, breathing of the, of the person. And this induces micro motion, so on the Hertz uh, frequency range um, uh, in, the, in the brain. On the right-hand side, what you see is also how much deformation the neural tissue will sustain upon movement. And this is a person in the scanner 
moving their head up and down. So this is just a physiological movement. And you can see that the, the spinal cord here that is in the, in the, at the center of the, of, the, of the scan is actually distorting. So stretching, compressing, and even twisting sometimes uh, quite significantly. So again, if you're anticipating placing a device in the vicinity here in the spinal cord, this is challenges or parameters that you need to account for for your implant. So if I summarize the metrics we need to account for in our design of, um, um, of uh, neural implant and neural interfaces is to consider scale. So we have scales that go from the micron. This, the typical individual neuron is of the order of uh, the cell bodies of the order of 20 micron. But I've shown you that you can have, if you consider the surface of the, of the brain, you know, we have easily geometry that are on the centimeter scale. Surfaces varies also a lot, and this is especially across species that you're, uh, you're uh, using to do your, your, your research. Then in terms of the um, uh, pro static property of the material, neural tissue are soft, heterogeneous, and anisotropic. So you have multiple materials, multi-layers that you have to account for. So the bone, of course, is the protective structure of the brain and the spinal cord with the vertebra. So it's pretty stiff, so a gigapascal material, but then you have the dura mater, which is a skin that protects the central nervous system. There we're in the range of megapascal. Then to have the softest component of the nervous system, the gray and the white matter, which are more in the kilopascal range. So you span the entire spectrum. And then third component is the uh, neural tissues are dynamic. And so you have this uh, regular uh, pulsing due to breathing and the uh, cardiac rhythm. So it's actually relatively small strain. So I wrote 5% here. It's probably even less uh, in terms of the, 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 the movement. But what is uh, important here is actually how often this de deformation happens during the, across the lifetime. But then you also have the haddock stretch or the stretch linked to the movement and the natural behavior of the person. And there, the deformation of the tissue can be actually much higher and reach physiologically up to 20%. So these are sort of the boundary condition that um, you need to account for when in your design. So now I'd like to move to the, the second part. And um, now that we know where, what, what is sort of the environment where we want to position neural electrodes, then I'll, I'll show you how we engineer elasticity to try and conform the surface of the nervous system. Um, so I, would, I, I think most of, of you in the seminar here are aware of this, um, this graph. We've, we've seen multiple versions of this already. But here, it's basically just a comparison between the E, the elastic modulus of materials in the biological domain and in the man-made uh, environment. And so, as we mentioned before, the, the brain tissue, the nervous system is the softest uh, material we can have, we, ha we do have in the body. So we're typically in the kilopascal, even less uh, in, in, some, in some portion of the, of the brain tissue. Now, if we look at the man-made materials, actually the good news is that we know how to engineer materials across the entire spectrum as well. The slightly not as good news is that a lot of the materials we can use to build electronic devices are sort of stuck on the left-hand side of the graph. So metals, silicon, so semiconducting material are really stiff material that are several orders of magnitude stiffer than the, the brain that we, we want to to interface. And um, the materials we, we, could, we can manipulate to, to, to be as soft as the brain as the hydrogel, but it's also currently quite challenging to actually manipulate precisely and in a reproducible manner uh, hydrogel. So there, there are very interesting work being uh, done uh, currently across several groups um, uh, to do bioelectronic ba based on hydrogel, but we are not yet at um, integration and miniaturization level that you could have, of course, for silicon. And then we uh, and others have worked quite a lot in using uh, rubbery material as the carrier for um, soft and deformable electronics. So there's a lot of option today. There's not a single solution, I would say. But the one we, we in my lab are, are currently exploring is how to use um, uh, soft uh, uh, rubbery material, so typically of the order of uh, a megapascal for the carrying material, 
and combine these material with sort of some of the more uh, classic inorganic materials to, to build some of the deformable uh, electrodes. And so how do you engineer elasticity by design? So I'm, it's a, I'm really glad that uh, I have uh, Tang, Jigeng, and Sigurd here at the, at the seminar today because this feels really like a reunion of our work some years ago, I would say. So you can see the first paper was actually in 2003. And this is really the challenge uh, that we, we address there is that how do you make a material that is in inherently not elastic, not deformable, actually deformable. And so when I joined um, uh, the Princeton, then there was already a lot of work in, in Sigurd's lab and, uh, and with the Gigang's team uh, on using thinness as a way to actually gain some deformability and in particular flexibility. And indeed, if you make a material thin enough, take uh, you know, cellulose and, um, and like this piece of paper coming from a tree trunk, if you miniaturize, if you make the structure thin enough, it will eventually become flexible. So that's was one first ingredient is that if you make things thin, you should be able to actually deform them uh, to some extent. But flexibility has um, some limitation in terms of the shape and the structure you can actually conform to. And so the next design was to actually do serpentine structures. So we also came up a couple of uh, years later uh, with this idea of doing serpentine or corrugated structures, which then become extensible. And the, you know, a macroscopic illustration of this is the telephone cord when you actually have a structure that is in three dimension, but with this corrugation that allows to have reversible deformation. And so with this concept, you can actually deposit multi layers and have actually minimum deformation and stress in the, in the film that are carried through this serpentine. So that was the second option. And then the third option uh, was really to explore if we, the structuration of the material. So if you engineer particular defects or particular uh, microstructure in, in this photograph, it's at the macro scale, you can actually form structure that should be, should be uh, reversibly deformable. And this was really the, the, the starting point of a lot of the work we've conducted in that uh, we actually found a way to introduce micro defects or my, what we call then micro cracks into thin metal film deposited on an elastic carrier. And through this structure, we're able to uh, have a fully reversible deformation. And uh, this is work we've done. So you, 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 some of you may have seen that before, but this is really the, 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 the result uh, of the structure that we have in those thin gold film that we deposit on PDMS. So PDMS is a, a standard silicone rubber. Um, and we can machine, we can deposit the metal film on the silicone rubber, just like we would do in a, in a standard microfabrication technique. And then those micro cracks are actually key to uh, enabling the overall deformation of the structure. And this is because the metal film through those uh, little openings can actually deform and deflect out of the plane, thereby minimizing the residual stress at the crack tip and therefore not propagating the cracks further and then allowing the overall deformation of the system. So we worked, um, the, the initial model was proposed by Tang, uh, this, uh, where we try to, to, to model the, these um, random micro crack structure in the gold into uh, structures that are um, more um, controlled, in, uh, produced in a more controlled manner. And so here, this is just to put some numbers in, in what I described in terms of the out of plane deformation and the minim minimum strain that is obtained locally in the structure compared to the applied strain. So what you're looking at here is a video of a um, polyimide structure into which we have replicated some of these cuts into the structure. We're stretching along the Y axis to 10% reversibly, and we have deformation um, uh, that we can compute uh, on, in the structure. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that when we apply 10% overall elongation, we never reach strain above 4%. So that's an efficient way to minimize the deformation in the structure. So we've been optimizing the pattern um, recently with uh, one of the, of the lab members 
Nicola Vashikovas, and then he explored different uh, shapes and, and, and structures. And we found that actually, if you, if you have a structure where we have rounded ending of the uh, of this of this structure we can actually have very very good uh, reversible elasticity in, in the structure and here is a demonstration where we have um, a very brittle material so ito indium tin oxide which is then um, because it's an oxide it actually does not withstand much um, deformation but once we we pattern it onto um, a plastic foil and we embed our microstructuration here, we can actually have a fully reversible structure. This is stretched to 10%. And then we use, um, we monitor the resistance of the structure as we are applying deformation. So here we had designed it so that uh, it sustained re reliably 10% uh, deformation. So we have almost no change in the resistance. And then if we keep stretching, of course, cracks start to appear. But here, if we stay within the 10% cycling, we actually have a very stable response of the structure. So we, we believe we have a structure that we then discovered that the, this, this way of um, perforating uh, foils is called kirigami. Uh, then uh, using the, uh, this kirigami design, then this is an efficient way to control an effective spring constant of your multi-layer and also looking at the electrical response of your of, of the of the film that you then pattern with this approach and so you can have good uh, electromechanical performance and this across many scales so going from the macro scale to the micro scale and so now coming back to the neural implant we've actually now recent uh, over the past uh, year we've actually implemented this technology to be able to form fully deformable and fully compliant electrode array based on platinum. So the, the technology I had shown you before with the microcrack gold is a spontaneous structure. So the, the gold microcrack uh, uh, pattern are actually occurring spontaneously on the gold film, but we could not do that in a, uh, we haven't found ways actually to do this in other metals. And so we, we with this approach here where we engineer the actual positioning of these microstructures, we can now open this up to a wide range of material and in particular platinum, which is one of the few materials that you can routinely implement into uh, clinical uh, implantable devices. And so we here what you're looking at is um, a micro pattern multi layer. So we have very thin structures. So we, we have this um, the platinum here is a few hundreds of nanometer in thickness embedded in a couple of micron of polyimide. And then in order to give some um, um, uh, overall thickness to the, to the structure, yet not impairing the overall elasticity, we embed the structure in a, in a silicone rubber uh, carrier that, uh, that hosts uh, the, the, the devices. So these are the, the overall structures that we, uh, materials property that we, we use. And the interesting aspect of this is that you can see that this is actually very multi-axial uh, geometry, which means that actually we can pattern the entire structure and do not worry about orientation of the pattern for the devices we want to produce afterwards. And so here, if I, ta if I take you through a typical design of some of our electrode arrays, these are contact pads that you see at the top here. These are interconnects and at the tip here we have some electrodes we can actually pattern the structure entirely with our uh, micro shapes um, across, the, across the structure, but then simply overlay a regular mask above the, uh, the structure so that we can actually uh, pattern uh, just like you would do a standard microlithography, photolithography with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the standard microfabrication techniques. And so with this, this is uh, now for those of you interested in more of the detail on the process flow, the typical stack that we're producing is uh, we always start with a, a silicon carrier wafer. Then we, we deposit our polyimide, platinum polyimide stack. We machine or we, we, we um, etch through our structure to form the, uh, the micro, micro pattern. So this is five micron as a scale bar. And then we embed with one layer of, of PDMS to, to, to do the top encapsulation. We release the structure and then we, uh, we embed in the secondary elastomer so that we have a fully compliant, fully uh, soft structure, yet it carries um, uh, platinum wiring. 
And so in terms of performance, uh, we, we do in the lab a lot of systematic characterization. So here we, we have two samples. The first one is a, a platinum track. So this is a top view photograph. So this is the, the width of the, of the platinum track. So it's the uh, platinum, as you, this is the, the, the bottom figure that you see here. We have the platinum embedded in the polyimide. We have two tracks next to each other. So actually here we have multiple of these. Whereas on the right hand side, this corresponds to this micro cracked or micro pattern tracks where each track now is no longer plain platinum, but it's uh, micro structured. And then we're stretching the device. So we're applying elongation on the y-axis of the, of, the, of the slide. And these are the results. So what we obtain is pretty striking because even the embedded and thin structure, if we start stretching the plain uh, platinum, it, immedi it very, almost immediately fails. So we have an open circuit after a couple of percent, actually 3%. We, you can see also there's strong distortion in the overall structure. Whereas here we can, with the micro structured um, devices, we can actually stretch them quite far. In this case, we, we went up to uh, 80%, but then coming back to more uh, physiological type of deformation. So we cycle to 10% and we've done that for a million cycle. And we do have a bit of a drift, but actually the relative change of the, of the resistance remain reasonable. And so um, this is just uh, to give you also the uh, force versus uh, apply strain uh, of the overall structure where it's the bare platinum. And then the Kirigami addition, if you want, in the uh, silicone membrane, in the PDMS membrane is actually uh, almost negligible. So because it's only two micron and we see it doesn't change much the stress strain curve of the, of the device. So this is one example of how you can use engineering of elasticity to actually produce um, very nice, uh, fully conformable and elastic structures. So now I'd like to switch to uh, the, the last part of the, of the presentation and um, explain some of our efforts in translating soft neural technology towards clinical use. So as I mentioned at the start of the talk, we're very much driven by developing devices that are that will have a therapeutical use. So we, 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 we talk, we discuss a lot with colleagues, both on the clinical environment and in neuroscience, and they come to us and saying, you know, it would be great if we could have a device that does this and that. And so a lot of the development we're making are with this perspective of uh, clinical use and translation. And so we quickly realized that actually there was no scheme or no uh, framework that would help us to actually translate an idea or a proof of concept that we have in the lab in a, in a rodent animal model and push it to uh, towards the clinic, not even clinical use, but actually advance it in, um, enough so that we can use it as a therapeutic device. And so we then spent uh, several years um, um, and this is work led by uh, one of, uh, of my postdocs, Giuseppe Schiavone. He, um, he actually really took the time to, ex to, to account for all of the steps that we need to, to improve to actually bring the technology to the next step level. And so scaling was something that is very important. As I mentioned before, the dimension of the neural tissue is significantly different when you go from rodent to non-human primate to human. That means also that we had to have very good manufacturing techniques and reproducibility in the device that we are manufacturing. Uh, because when you do experiment in rodent, usually you have a larger number of animals. So you can potentially accommodate some uh, device failure, although you, 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 should, you really do your best to avoid that. But when you start doing non-human primate research, this is something that is actually really not possible because the number of animals is very low. So you have to have devices that are very good reproducibility and um, very good stability and reliability. And the, the, the other aspect that uh, I will touch upon is that also when you start developing systems that are going to be used to its uh, clinical application, you also want to, um, to have uh, a good compatibility with some of the existing technologies that the surgeon are actually used to. And so here I'll come back to uh, our initial concept. So the microcrite gold 
has been used and implemented um, uh, initially to, to be um, uh, delivering electrical modulation to the spinal cord. So this is work uh, done in collaboration with my colleague Grégoire Courtin here at EPFL, who is an expert in restoring locomotion after spinal cord injury. And this particular video was taken by Ivan Minev, then um, a postdoc in the lab, and he's actually also on the call. So I look forward also to discussion with him later on. But so here, what you're looking at is a device that is, as you can see, fully deformable, fully elastic. And at the heart of the device is our micro cracked goal that enables the stretchability of the system. And so this is where we were. So this, vi this video is basically the step where we started in the next phase of the project. So we had the proof of concept. We were, we've been able to implant these devices into uh, rodent and they were delivering electrical pulsing and uh, we, we could use it to restore um, walking in, in rodent with spinal cord injury. So super excited. But then where we want to go is here. So it's to go to a clinical trial and, 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 and technology that could be useful for humans. But of course, there's a long path in between. And some people will say, you know, oh yeah, but this is the job of a startup, et cetera. Actually, not necessarily. And this is what I hope this framework is, um, um, is going to, to show. And I would really encourage those of you who are motivated towards bringing technology towards real life application to actually consider this effort. Because actually, as you develop this translation, or you use this translational framework, actually lots of innovation occur as well. And, and there's lots of science and it's not just an engineering, purely engineering um, uh, scheme. And so technology translation is important and it's not always possible to do it uh, uh, and outsource it. So there's some technology, especially when you develop novel material that uh, no company actually can actually manufacture them. So you have to do them in house. So let me drive you through our translational framework because it has multiple steps. Um, so it can be a bit confusing initially, but the starting point is really the, 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 this one here, which is understanding where you want to position your device. So I will take our, con in our context, we're looking at spinal cord. So you have to really look at the spinal cord and take and in order to understand where the device will be positioned is to actually do real imaging of the, uh, of the environment. So if you do animal work, you do 3D imaging of the, uh, of the spinal cord of the, of, the, of the specimen. And then you develop two things. The first thing is you develop a synthetic model of the spinal cord. And I'll explain why this is useful or, or the other organ if, you're, if this is the other context. Or, and then you use this system here to actually start design the layout of your device and, um, and start producing the device. So you need to have a controlled manufacturing environment so you can improve and optimize uh, the reproducibility and the reliability of your manufacturing. And when, the, when you are ready with your device, when you are ready with your synthetic model, you can combine the two to actually uh, use the both system into what we call a biomimetic in vitro validation. So it's a system that looks like as much as you can do in vitro to the biological environment. And it allows you to actually test and age your system in a very biomimetic environment. Usually when you test electrode or devices in vitro, you dip your structure into a saline solution. Sometimes you do what we call accelerated aging. So you heat up a little bit more to fasten some of the diffusion processes to, to, to have your device fail. But this is in fact not sufficient. What we, when we did this experiment, we found that this was not telling us you know, some of the um, potential failure mechanism that we had once we placed the device in vivo. And so here with a realistic 3D model that combines the anatomy, the static, but also the dynamics. So here we have a platform that I'll show a, a small video of in a few minutes. Then we can we 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 had inputs of the uh, biological environment, but also the dynamic environment of the structure. And you can place your device in here, use your device to so stimulate or record information with the, with this device, and then you can do analysis. If it fails, 
if your electrodes don't perform the way they're supposed to, or if they fail over time, you can then go back to your design, your control manufacturing and reiterate. And this without the use of a single animal. So this is also very important because that's, uh, that, that allows you to progress quickly. And then once you're actually satisfied with the performance using this in vitro validation, then you can move to the in vivo validation in large animal models. Typically, you will use sheep or, or, or pig for pure biocompatibility um, uh, evaluation. But if you want to use uh, and validate the device and the technology for more functional or therapeutical application, then non-human primate model are the, the animal to use. And so this is really the, the, the work we've been developing over the last five years. And um, this is quite uh, time consuming, but actually a mandatory step to bring the technology forward. And now I'll just uh, give um, a, a few examples of, uh, of, of what it looks like to actually do this. So if we now come back to the uh, example I showed before of the implant that we positioned on the spinal cord. So we went from the rat validation to non-human primates. So this is the cross section of the spinal cord. So you see that the geometry went from an implant sitting at the surface of the spinal cord, which was about a, a few millimeter width. Here we're reaching about eight millimeter in width. So that's a, a little, a, quite a, a geometrical change. Of course, in the length, this is also changing significantly. Then we, we introduced in our clean room um, uh, quite uh, controlled manufacturing so that we can now at the wafer level fabricate devices and from one device to another here you, in that photograph you have four devices and um, each so the, these four devices have a total of 42 electrodes and each and the, the objective is that each electrode are functional and have the same spec and so we introduced also systematic characterization and uh, steps during the process that allowed us to, to control and validate the different deposition um, and uh, steps in the, in the process flow. And then this is just to give you a little bit of the history of improvement as we go, went from an entirely manual pr process when we started to do this, uh, this first device to this full wafer scale uh, manufacturing. And what you're looking at here is the standard deviation in kilo ohms for a number of electrodes at different frequencies. So we, this, this is um, the, from the impedance spectrum of our electrode. But the important message here is that actually this standard deviation goes down as we improve uh, the reproducibility and the manufacturing of our device. And the device yield is going up. So that's the, the, the red curve. We're still not at 100% yield. I think in an academic clean room, this is something that is very difficult to achieve. But we're actually close to 80% now, which means that any device we, a wafer we make, on them, 80% of our device are fully functional and have specs that are very, very reproducible from one, back, one device to another. Then this is the step. Uh, to, to build the actual biomimetic uh, structure. So uh, I mentioned before, we have this platform that allows us to not only age the device in a, in a, in a saline or ionic solution that is uh, similar to the medium that you would have in vivo, but in addition to that, we have a system that uh, replicates the mechanical motion of the spinal cord in situ. And so we did that by doing a lot, uh, several MRI scans so that we could extract from the, the, the MRI scans 3D models. So we use 3D printed to print uh, the model of the vertebra. We, we used uh, hydrogel and silicone to model the spinal cord tissue. So we assembled the two to do a model of the spinal canal and the spinal cord. And then we actually implanted the device exactly where it's supposed to be uh, when we do the, uh, the in vivo evaluation. So this is the device. This is an electrode that we pushed and inserted into the environment, into the uh, artificial spinal cord and spinal canal. And then we position this into our platform. And you can see with those screws here at the bottom and the, the plate at the bottom at the top, we can actually mount this into this platform and the platform is moving. And the movement of the platform corresponds to the movement we had computed from uh, MRI scan of the animal with the head. So this, this is the actually cervicals, uh, the cervical portion of the spine. And so we looked at how much extension and compression the spine of the non-human primate 
is we standing at, um, naturally. So these are two different MRI scans that we use to compute the absolute values movement uh, of, the, of the spinal cord um, in situ. And this is how it looks like. So this, this is a short video uh, of the, the system in action. So what you see here is this movement, which actually sounds, uh, looks very modest, in fact, but really corresponds to the type of deformation that the spine will withstand when the animal is moving its head up or down and left and right. So that's really replicate and we can program the structure uh, uh, on demand. So we can cycle the device over time. And here, what you don't see, this is into an incubator. So we maintain the overall structure at 37 degrees C. The blue here is just to, to, to highlight the, the liquid, but the, this is, uh, we have two blue LEDs at the bottom to, for, for the light lightning, but the, 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 the solution here is a silane solution. So it's in the, this ionic solution so that we are as close as possible to the biology. So what we're missing really here is just the, the, the actual biological cells, cells and, and the blood flow. And then what we use this platform for is, is to do and conduct electrical pulsing. So we age the, the electrode over time to see how they withstand this overall system. And we monitor the impedance and the, um, the voltage transient of, the, of, this material, of this electrode. And this is a typical example. I won't go into the detail, but what we do over time is monitoring the impedance. And I lost my mouse. We, uh, we monitor the impedance uh, of, the, of the electrode across multiple mechanical cycles and for various technology. And we compare, so the different colors here correspond to different electrode technology. Now, the next step is to actually, and I'm watching the time, I think I'm going over time, so I'll go a bit quicker. So the next step, once you are, um, you've reached a level in vitro with a biomimetic platform that is satisfactory is to actually do a, what is called an acute validation in vivo. And so here, what you're looking at, at the top, um, at the top uh, right, you have a photograph of one of the implants that, uh, is, um, has, um, that we designed for the cervical spinal cord. This is uh, um, uh, a scan of the actual spinal cord of the, of the animal we, we tested. And this is the uh, position of the electrode uh, along the section of the, of the spinal cord. And we use these devices to actually elicit particular muscle activity. And so this was a test to validate that the electrode could actually deliver electrical pulses to the right region along the spinal cord and have the right muscle response. And what you, what you see here, the, the gray scale corresponds to increasing current that we're sending with the, the, with the electrode. So the more current we're sending, the more activity we should have. And these are across multiple muscle in the arm. And these are for different electrodes, two, three, two, five, and seven that we use to stimulate. And so this was a, an important validation step that the technology now not only is robust to the deformation, can sustain the implantation, but actually can elicit um, what we were expecting from this epidural stimulation. And this is where international uh, interdisciplinary team is super important because of course we, we're just the technology and engineering team, but we work with, uh, with three other professors who are actually guiding us in um, the design of these electrode and the implementation and use of the electrode. And then the ultimate test is to actually do a chronic evaluation of the device. And this is where actually we had the highest challenges because when you do chronic evaluation, that means your system needs to be fully implantable. And so that means we need to have um, uh, um, implantable electronic hardware that can be uh, uh, used for a long time and that we can interface with. And the one, the standard, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, the standard implantable pulse generator or this system, and they have a very set boundary condition in terms of how much voltage or how much uh, current can, can be actually delivered by this, uh, by this system. So the first thing was that we had to actually connect to these things. And this was, um, this is a, a so that's the stimulator. This is the cable with the connector that we had to interface with. So this is one of our implants with the lead that, that actually fits that uh, particular connector. And then we actually had to see whether the electrode 
were compatible with the power and the voltage uh, actually um, uh, compliance that the stimulator could deliver because these stimulators are typically also um, um, designed for electrodes that are typically foils of platinum, so they're very conductive, so very low resistance. But in our technology, because we're using pin film and uh, structured technology, we have um, typically more resistive uh, response of, of the electrode. And so one test you want to do with this chronic evaluation is how stable the electrode is over time. And so one way to do this is to measure and monitor some of the activation voltage uh, of uh, when you do the electrical pulsing. Again, I won't go into the details here, but what we, what we see, we do this over time and the red line here corresponds to how much voltage, our, the voltage compliance of our stimulator. So technology would fail over time if we go over that voltage compliance because then the stimulator was not able to deliver sufficient power. But we did ha uh, have a, a technology where we had a sufficient, uh, a good response after six weeks that you see here. And then the next step is to explant your device and do some analysis of the, the status of the surface of the implant, etc. So now I've, I've given you nearly all the, all the chain uh, of uh, the steps and the technological validation that you need to do uh, for these devices. The last one is actually imaging, because this is quite important once you have chronic implantation to actually be able to locate your device and see whether, first of all, it's in the right position and if over time it moves. Um, and here, these are MRI scan. Uh, so this, the resolution is not so good, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, but the important message here is that this is an implant uh, that is positioned uh, on the, um, uh, on the brainstem, and you see here massive artifacts, so you actually don't see anything. Whereas here we place the device into our, using our soft technology, FinFin technology, and you have actually nearly no artifacts. We barely see the device. And so that's actually nice because you, you, you don't, the, the position of the device is not occluding the, um, the overall view of the, of the surgeon uh, or, the, or the doctor afterwards when they want to see the, this. If you use CT scan, which is an, another imaging technique, uh, you see also here quite clearly the big artifact with the standard devices, electro device, which are made with much thicker metal. Whereas here with the techniques that we're developing, you actually only see the position of the electrode and that's it, there's no artifact. So actually the field of view surrounding the implant is very clear. So this is another advantage of using fin film technology for neural implant. So now I reached a conclusion. So um, I think it's very important to understand um, the mechanics of the, and the physiology, of course, but the, 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 the mechanical environment and the mechanical response of the tissue that you want to interface with. Of course, my talk is fully oriented towards neural application, but I believe this is exactly the same for any other organs that you may want to, uh, to interrogate or interface with. And so having good biomimetic mechanical design will contribute to better biointegration in vivo. The introduction of microfabrication in neural implant actually opens up a complete freedom in the design of your implant and in particular in the electrode layout. So you can position the electrodes according to the anatomy of the very um, patient that you want to, uh, to, to, to use the device. So I think this is also something very important. And um, I think academia can drive the effort in translation, uh, in translating uh, technological innovation. This is hard work because uh, it's very time consuming, but uh, I think we can make progress and we, uh, in this without you know, necessarily spinning off uh, immediately a company. And um, also there's a lot of new science when we, do, when we developed and used the, 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 this uh, multi-model biomimetic platform, we found that there's lots of failure modes that, that occurred in the metallization we developed that we could not see in standard stretching experiment. And then we had to actually revisit and, and re-innovate in, in finding new ways to develop this, um, this metallization. Of course, there are many, many challenges before we can use such technology in humans. First of all, you need to translate all of the polymer material in particular that one's used into medical grade material. So, that's something we're currently doing. 
you have to also introduce good manufacturing practice or good lab practice into your environment because you need traceability uh, of all the materials and all the steps that you, you, you are conducting. Another big challenge is really the implantable electronics and the telemetry. At the moment, clinically, there's very few options. The one I showed you, the implantable pulse generator, is just uh, one um, uh, element. But uh, there's very few options of what we can connect and interface with. And um, um, so there's lots of work I think we can, we can do here. And then long-term stability is very much linked to encapsulation materials and also there, Currently, especially for active electronic, there are very few options where you can have years long uh, approach and, and, and stable encapsulation of the materials. So lots of work upcoming for, for, the, for the years. Um, so with this, I'd like to thank my group. So we're in Switzerland, so I had to show some mountains, although it's not the right season now, but um, so it's a very uh, superb group. Uh, I'm very happy to work with all of them every day. Very different background uh, for, for the lab member in the team. But one thing that is quite special is that nearly each of the team members start in the clean room and end up into working into an operating room. So it, they have to actually this versatility in their experiment, which uh, I, they, I like very much. And then uh, the last point is also we, we are working in the, in the Center for Neuroprosthetic at, at, at EPFL which is a center that is very much, that gathers 12 PI at the moment. And each of us have, are very much driven with the translational research and bringing technology to, to the patient. And we have people in the team who are material scientists, who are electrical engineer, neuroscientists, we have clinicians and, um, and through this uh, inter built-in interdisciplinary, we can actually um, bring uh, some of this project forward. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Let's give her the applause. <laughs> Sorry, I went uh, over time. <laughs> I always love your talks. You, you explain so well, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, if I may, I want to ask a, a very simple question. When uh, my experience in in building complete systems demonstrations is that you cannot experiment, conduct experiments at all levels. Uh, you have to fix things at some point. Yep. Uh, how do you handle this? You know, for example, uh, you cannot always exchange uh, the elastomer as you do this. You have to settle on one. Uh, how do you handle this? Because uh, the the, the nature of research is just to always play around. Yes, uh, and I think that's the most difficult one because at some point where, when we have the a design and the system that works, we have to agree that we're not changing it. And so for the, so now we're, we're in the middle of, of actually doing this now where we translate some of the material to the medical grade materials where then now once this is changed, that's it. We cannot change the, the, the option. Um, where we also have pretty fixed boundary, as I, as I mentioned, when we go to chronic application is that we have to work with the currently available pulse generator. So this is also something we cannot change. So we have to actually go around and use that. Uh, I see that Tanya Ratzaba uh, raised her hand. Uh, please, uh, when you come to ask your question, identify yourself and also your institution. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Ah, I'm so excited. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Mangoma, but you can call me Tanya, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm actually working on additive manufacturing of bioelectronics, and I focus mostly on uh, organic um, electrochemical devices. So your talk was really interesting to me. Um, my question was this. So when you're talking about translational work, um, I understand you do 3D printing of uh, the spinal cord to kind of see the motions. Why aren't you also using additive manufacturing techniques like 3D printing to actually make your devices? Because I understand when it does come to clinical use, you will need to be able to make those devices tailored to a person and traditional uh, microfabrication techniques like the ones you're using where they need the clean room and silicon technology won't be as quick a turnaround in 
in the same way. So just a, just a, a question, like it's, it's one of the like, curiosity questions. Yes, so, um, so two, two things. At the moment uh, with um, the 3D, uh, so 3D printing or additive manufacturing, some of the resolution for the, pat the patterning is not uh, low, high enough actually to, to do the design and the density of electrode we would need, for example, and the choice of materials may also be not entirely suitable. So you need very good conductors to actually build, um, uh, especially the interconnect. Um, and 3D printed uh, version of uh, conducting material are quite resistive still. And so I, don't, I, I think uh, this is again, when trade off, it depends to what you will connect the device, but that's one limitation. Um, and the second one, <clears throat> so yes, working in a clean room may not be as fast as doing uh, the 3D printing, but uh, I think this is compared to the way it's done today, where all of these implants are actually manually assembled. <laughs> Even if, we, it, if, if it spends one week to actually do the design and the manufacturing in a clean room, I think we, in terms of time, this will be actually quite an improvement. And the fact that you can personalize is also very important because the, the current clinical devices are, it's one size that fits every single patient. Yeah. So the idea of the opportunity to be able to tailor the, the, the layout and the exact positioning of your electrode is actually uh, the motivation. Thank you. Thank you. Su Lin Zhang, uh, uh, you're next. Uh, please identify yourself and your institution. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm Su Lin Zhang from Penn State. I'm uh, one of the uh, associate editors uh, for EML. <laughs> So, um, so Simi, it's very uh, nice talk. Uh, give us uh, a rich history of your career path, particularly your co collaborations with Tenant and Jigong. So my, my question is very simple. I, I see that you're trying to manufacture the soft uh, conductors to, uh, uh, for transition research or characterization. Um, we know that our home body fluid uh, Basically, ionic yeah. conductors, right? So those are those 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 uh, uh, materials that you use are electronic uh, conductors. Uh, so it's it's very funny that uh, in electrochemistry uh, field, we we are now in a transition from uh, organic uh, liquid electrolyte to inorganic solid electrolyte to make all solid state uh, batteries, right? Do you say uh, any, do you envision that we could use ionic, uh, ionic conductors to uh, as 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 you uh, as your device rather than uh, rather than electronic uh, conductors? So that's a good that's a good point. I mean the the it it all depends on the overall system. So in, in our case, as long as we connect to standard electronics to generate the pulses or to do the signal amplification, if we do recording, we have to have a transition to ionic to electronic or electronic to ionic. So that's have, until we use the conventional electronics, we'll have to, to have some sort of a, a tran transduction ion to electron. Fully, fully ionic system may be something, um, is definitely something exploring. We, there's also a lot of work in organic electronics now where people are really also leveraging and, uh, and um, <clears throat> improving this transduction mechanism from ion to electrons. So that's another route. Fully ionic, uh, why not? Uh, one challenge I can see at the moment is also the, um, the manufacturing and the, and the microfabrication of, of this material, because uh, it's, uh, it might not be easy to, to manipulate and miniaturize sufficiently so that we can use it in, uh, in, in vivo. But I think these are typically, there are multiple paths. What I've shown you today is really our effort towards translation, where actually you need to learn to be very conservative that's uh, that's something we're learning on the way that I, I, you know there's as you move towards the clinical use you have to change fewer and fewer things and therefore you cannot uh, afford to actually bring in something you don't really fully understand 
but we it's also very important that in the preclinical work we actually there's a lot of new ideas that are coming out including using uh, ionic uh, gels and ionic materials because maybe indeed um, you know they, they should they can be integrated in the next generation of devices thank you thank you anastasia oh hi i'm anastasia elias from university of alberta in canada um, my question is about um, stability of devices. So you highlighted many of the challenges in translating um, these devices to the clinic. And in addition to the internal or inherent mechanical stability of the devices, um, for your eDura for chronic use, I, I assume you're going to want it to stay in one place so that you're always targeting or addressing the same mm -hmm. pools of neurons. So uh, how do you prevent um, that device from from Sliding. moving around within the um, the spinal cord. Yeah, so this is where it's uh, we here we work a lot with uh, actually a, a clinical surgeon who is implanting these devices in patient, not ours, but the 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 the, the clinical one, and so she came up with a lot of inputs in how to secure the device. Uh, so the big difference we have, for example, at the moment with um, conventional spinal surgery, where you only have one point of entry, so one laminectomy, we always have two, uh, because we have to actually, we pull the device through. Um, but what we found quite surprisingly is that over time, the device conforms very well, the surface of the spine, and therefore we never had issue of significant sliding. So I think here also the interface, the matching of the mechanics is very important. If you, if, I think if you have something that is very thin and but not sufficiently com conformal, then you have the risk indeed of sliding at the surface of the, the tissue. But in our case, we, we do have some thickness to the device. We have several hundreds of microns. So it's enough to actually do a little mat really that sits on the surface of the spine. And we haven't seen uh, tilting and sliding. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. David Weitz, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Dave Weitz. I'm at Harvard. I work with Zhigong. Um, I'm privileged to work with Zhigong, as you probably realize. Um, that was a beautiful talk. Um, so me, I'm a very simple-minded soft matter physicist, and um, I know how to estimate elasticity. Um, that's sort of something, as you point out, you have to do in soft matter. And you showed this beautiful example of how you can uh, combine hard materials and soft materials by changing the shape and achieve some elasticity that's somewhere intermediate between the two. Uh, for example, your platinum wires, things like that. So my question to you is, is there some way um, of having a, is there a way that I can do a back of the envelope calculation to tell me what the best way is to configure the material and what the uh, final uh, elasticity or extensibility or stretchability is? Can I do that in some back of the envelope way? Do you understand that well enough now or is it still yeah. all empirical? So, no, that's I think where um, we have, so, what is not empirical anymore is really the geometry. So this now with the imaging of the, of the actual and tissue that you want to interface, you can really get your geometry right. So that's something that, uh, that is uh, important. In terms of really computing the compliance, um, I think uh, it, currently there's only ranges of, uh, of, uh, of numbers, I would say for, uh, for the, the elasticity, the compliance of the, of, the, of the spine or of the brain. There's not like a technique that allows us e easily to actually telling you here is this particular specimen, here's the number of, your, of, of the elasticity. There's really not sufficient at the moment non-invasive technique that allow you to have the exact metric. So then you can compute and, and do modeling. So a lot of the modeling that is done today takes a number in the range of the one I gave you, but it's, we don't have really uh, accurate numbers, I would say. 
So I, I was thinking of something even simpler, then I'll shut up. I'll just ask you this one question. Uh, like your kirigami structure, is the kirigami shape the optimized shape or could uh -huh. you imagine okay. something more complicated? I mean, how do you know to choose one shape mm -hmm. or the other? So not, not the body that's too complicated for me, but just your beautiful examples of mixing, uh, you know, soft materials and wires and making them extensible. Can you tell me, do you know what the optimized shape is? No, I don't. Um, but there's been a, so work done by uh, John Rogers' team some years ago. Actually, they explored quite a wide range of design, and they've tested, I think, exhaustively, not exhaustively, but at least 20 different shapes uh, to actually come down to one that would have the less stress or so. But uh, I don't have, a, unfortunately, a model that would tell us, okay, this is exactly the shape, because you need a trade-off between the geometry, the mechanics, and the electrical performance. And so that's what is actually setting the, the, the so uh, because the mechanics will tell you, you need to have the narrowest and the thinnest structure, but the electrical performance will tell you, oh, actually, I need sufficient width to have a low enough resistance. And so this is the type of trade-off you need to do. And I currently don't have a model for that, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Guan Song Hong, uh, you're next. Guan Song Hong. Hello, uh, my name is Guan Song Hong and uh, I am uh, assistant professor at Stanford. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie, for giving a very inspiring and informative talk. That was a beautiful talk. My question is very simple. So uh, you have demonstrated very beautifully that you e dural could be used to deliver electrical charges for uh, uh, neuroprosthetic purposes. And I was wondering, since the e dural is placed onto the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, which is interfacing mostly of the sensory part of the spinal cord, have you imagined uh, of delivering this uh, uh, soft electronics to the ventral part to uh, interrogate and uh, uh, also uh, stimulate the uh, the motor part better. Thank you. Um, so this is more a question for my surgeon colleagues, <laughs> because uh, in our case, you know, whether we in the design to position one side or the other of the spinal cord is not a big issue to some extent to the layout of the electrodes, but it's really the surgical approach that then needs to be carefully thought of if you need to, uh, to stimulate the, the ventral roots. Um, for all of the application we've be, we, we're exploring, we haven't had the need to go to the ventral side. Um, but in optimizing the positioning of the electrode, we actually had to go through several iteration of how you insert, how you, we actually had to design also specific tools to help on the surgical insertion. So I anticipate that for the for the others for the ventral side, you would want to actually do and explore these as well. So you would probably need probably using what we have would not uh, immediately work for for the ventral side because the surgical approach would be very different. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eduard Arzt. Please is next. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Eduard Arzt, Leibniz hello. Institute for New Materials. Hello. Stephanie, I enjoyed very much your talk and also seeing your lab not too long ago. Uh, hello also to this illustrious group of friends and colleagues. Uh, well, my question actually comes back to, to David White's question a little bit. Isn't it a little bit surprising that by doing a 2D uh, structure or pattern, you can accommodate all the complicated 3D uh, strains and deformations that that go on in, in the body and wouldn't wouldn't it also be interesting to look at say uh, oxetic structures mm -hmm. um, of course at the expense of becoming even more complex uh, but that could maybe give you more uh, some room for improvement in in the third dimension or or maybe it's not necessary and, and actually, my second add-on is, are you happy with all the materials you are using? Or would new polymers or uh, new materials in general be uh, useful? Or would this be counterproductive because of approval issues? Mm -hmm. so, um, so the first question on the, the 2D going to 3D, um, I think really the, the key there is that although we're, we're doing this 2D pattern, we're actually effectively doing 2D plus because we are 
allowing the structure to deform in the third dimension. And that's even if it's embedded in the overall carrier, elastomeric carrier, we do have this out of plane deformation. So there is some three dimension in there. Introducing more complex like the oxtetic uh, uh, design, why not? We actually have not uh, tried it, but this is something we've been looking at papers indeed, but we haven't had the opportunity to implement it. And maybe in some application, this is useful. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but here, just for sake of you know, time and efforts, we, we haven't had the, the opportunity to try. Uh, and then new materials. Um, so when we started, we used whatever was at hand, right? So we used Silgard 184, like everybody else doing some sort of silicone. And it turns out that this is really not uh, an ideal elastomer because it tears a lot. And for a lot of, uh, of these type of application, this is not um, ideal. Nonetheless, we, for anything that we, when we do a quick trial and test, that's still the material we use. But we're not, as now we're looking at more um, medical grade silicones that we see that there are materials that are actually much more elastic and viscous. Uh, then the then the seal guard and this uh, change a little bit the behavior, but overall we we managed to actually um, implement and, and and do devices with the med grade uh, silicones, um, okay. and so new materials. I think um, this is a there's always a, a trade off, right? Because once you and we we haven't even reached yet the medical environment, the clinical environment, because we you we are at a stage where we now can fabricate these devices. And, but we have now to actually get them approved. And so, and once you do this phase, you cannot, you have to do it for every single change, right? So if we introduce, keep introducing new materials, we'll have to redo this phase of validation every time. And so this is a choice then, if really something is wrong in one material, then of course you will go and, vi and revisit. But um, I think new materials should be explored definitely for the preclinical side. And then if you see, you see a substantial improvement in performance, then of course you have to try and translate it. But I would not do that systematically, that's for sure. Mm. And, um, and for us, the micro patterning was key really in introducing also the platinum because gold, although it's inert, this is not a material that uh, is uh, easily approved for, uh, for electrical stimulation. In, in, in the clinical environment. So platinum mm. is, is better. Okay, we find in a different context that moving to a medical grade material can actually raise a whole new lot of questions. Uh, so it's certainly good to do this early on. Yeah, it costs a lot of money though, <laughs> because the medical grade polymers are much more expensive than, uh, but I think this is something again you have to leverage because if you develop an entire chain and then when you switch one material everything becomes irrelevant or you have to re-optimize then this is a, a not good either yeah thanks a lot thank you Xi Beng Li of Leuven please hello Stephanie can you hear me yes yeah uh, thanks very much for your very intriguing presentation. Uh, my name is Chi Feng Lei. I am a PhD candidate of uh, Kai Leuven uh, from Belgium. And uh, I, I've got three questions. And the first question, uh, the first question is the, the similar as uh, Anastasia, is about how is uh, your uh, reli reliability of your device? I mean, for example, when you buy a, a set of uh, earphone, uh, you, you have a guarantee or you have potentially, you, you, you know that it can be used for one year or even more. Correct. But yeah. So um, we're not yet, uh, we are clearly not at the stage where we have devices that are reliable for a lifetime. Yeah. Um, okay. And so in the, in the clinical devices, you have three categories of devices. You have the intraoperative one. Yes. That are approved up to 30 days. So use in vivo for 30 days in, 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 in patients, in human. And then those that are more chronically and lifelong used. And yes. so we are at the very beginning of the procedure. 
So what we're aiming for now is this short-term validation, but we don't have a, 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 a years-long uh, validation of the, of the device. Okay. And the second, the uh, second question is about how do you, when you uh, conduct an experiment on the vivo tissue, how do you choose the uh, uh, the criteria of the, the choice? I mean, for example, if it is a monkey, what kind of monkey or like the age? Mm -hmm. Because because with the age precising, the the uh, stiffness might be a little bit different. No. Right. Right. So, so, so the, 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 there's uh, several non-human primate species that are used in neuroscience research. So we then we used uh, the, 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 I would say the standard one. So one example is the resist type of monkeys. This is one, uh, one, one type that is often used. Uh, but what we found to answer your second part of the question is that actually all the animals we, we work with, uh, we do imaging. So that's the first step we, we will do. We do MRI scans, CT scans of the animal to get the right dimensions and the right geometry. Yeah, yeah. And the last question is about the uh, mechanical performance. How do you quantify the mechanical performance of your material? I mean, it's, uh, as you said, it's kind of like multi-coupling, like different. It's not mm -hmm. like pure tension or pure compression or pure twisting. So. Um, so, in terms of the, the platform, the biomimetic platform, the way we've quantified was really to, to take coordinates of the position of the spine as the animal was in particular position, the maximum and the minimum, and that's how we reconstructed the overall movement. So that's one, one, one aspect to quantify. Um, and then the other, the other aspect is also to, to see when you do the so when you do the surgery, you know how much force you need or how to insert or to pull the device out of the of the of the spinal canal. So we we've actually done measurement where we had the implant in place and we've measured how much force is needed to actually explant it. Um, yes. So that's the type you do this in situ. That's that's what you need to to do to quantify. Oh yeah, thanks very much. I think it would be nice if you can like come up of a criteria which can be established into like some sort of internationally so that, pe can, that people can follow. Mm -hmm. And also, because I, I'm doing something on the uh, 3D printing uh, bio-inspired structure. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that. And I'm, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the, the big challenge in the overall domain in the field is really the indeed finding the right norms. At the moment, the norms have been developed for technology that are ancient, right? Technology that yeah. were developed in the 70s and they have not, the norms have not changed since. As we start introducing new materials, new, you know, some of the, the norms and the, the information there becomes irrelevant. And so there's a, there's a need for indeed a, an update on some of the norms, but it's, this is a challenging, uh, because it's not just down to the scientists. There's a lot of yeah, yeah. people involved yeah, in those regulatory bodies. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tahir Saif. Hello, uh, Tahir Saif from the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. Again, good to see many friends uh, from the other side of the world as well. Um, and wonderful talk. What a nice combination of um, engineering and, uh, and biological application, medical applications. So uh, one question I had is, uh, you know, at any segment of the of the uh, neuronal region, there are thousands of neurons that go out uh, and particularly in the spinal cords or any place in the neural system. Uh, but in the engineered system, you have only limited number of electrodes that you can use to stimulate. So what limits us towards many, many more, many orders of more number of electrodes uh, to create the stimulation that we need I, I, I understand that you made a, an argument where the size is probably determined by the conductivity of the wires that are carrying the simulations um, and my, microfabrication, but microfabrication can be done at a much finer scale. Um, so mm -hmm. you can shed light on that one. 
Yeah. And I have a sort of a philosophical question and I then stop, uh, which is these neurons are taking the signals from the engineered system. So there could be a potential interaction between them. In other words, the neurons might be being trained by the stimulation that they're getting from the outside source, mm -hmm. which means that eventually their response to the stimulation may also change. Yeah. Uh, how do we account for this crosstalk? Mm -hmm. So on the first point, um, for electrical stimulation, I think we have to distinguish recording and stimulation in mm -hmm. terms of when we talk about electrode density and electrode of dimension. Mm -hmm. um, adding many more electrodes will not necessarily help because the, bio, the biological tissue is a, a basically an electrical sink. So if you have many electrodes all stimulating at the same time, you actually, the volume of tissue that is recruited by one electrode will overlap with the neighboring one if they're too close. And therefore the effect will be pretty much the same. So you have to actually, uh, there, there's a trade-off between how dense, how small an electrode can be, depending on the volume of activation of your electrode. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, so I think uh, in terms of electrical stimulation, I don't foresee that we will get to super high density for a given surface area of, of tissue. Mm -hmm. On the other end, for the recording purpose, that's different because mm -hmm. you may be able, if you bring electrode in closer proximity to the neuron, you may be able to collect very different type of information. So if you go to, if you take the, the, the large electrode like EEG, et cetera, so they're not even close to the neurons, they're on the skull, they will actually collect neuronal information that is a network information, so dialogue between different neurons. If you shrink down the dimension, if you bring the electrode closer to the tissue, you'll get more and more specific information. So high density electrode becomes very interesting if you go through penetrating interfaces. So when you you go through the brain, through the, the neural tissue, so that you can get one electrode in very close proximity to maybe one neuron. Mm -hmm. So it's a, again, it's really a trade-off and depends on the application you're targeting. Mm -hmm. There are things you may, it's, it may be also over engineering to go for a one-to-one -one electrode, one neuron, one electrode. Maybe actually the network information is sufficient for the function you want to detect. So again, this is very much uh, specific on the application. Mm -hmm. um, and your, your, your second uh, question around training and, and, oh, um, and, uh, and actually this is exactly what is happening. Um, so in the, if I take back the, uh, the spinal cord example, so we use these electrodes to actually stimulate a portion of the spinal cord that is disconnected from the brain. Mm -hmm. So this is in the context of spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we apply electrical stimulation to the dorsal roots of the spinal cord that is no longer receiving command from mm -hmm. the brain to actually move the leg. And what we have observed, we actually, our colleague, uh, Gregoire Cortin and his team, who are really the, the, the neuroscientists driving this, they have observed that if you keep stimulating, you also encourage the biology to repair itself. Mm -hmm. So we, in, in most of these uh, spinal cord injury in patients in, that, in particular that um, they've been looking into is that there's always a remaining portion of the spinal cord that is viable. So there's the injury, but the portion of the, of the fibers are still there. And what they've observed is that by stimulating the spinal cord below the injury, this is actually promoting plasticity and reorient mm -hmm. uh, reactivation and, and new connection of the, of the tissue that was damaged, or at least the, re, the remaining tissue. So there is a level of plasticity and mm -hmm. modification of the, of the wiring of the nervous system through neuroprosthetic. And mm -hmm. it's not excluded. And this is also an aspect that, is, that we've learned is important is that um, a lot of these neural in interfaces may be very useful to, to help restore function, but eventually if the biology do it by itself, Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you can use the, the, the prosthesis just for a few years, you remove it, mm -hmm. and that's it. So that's, um, 
an option that where you can put the device in and the device out is also uh, an important design uh, aspect. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Joan, hey, Jao. Hello, Stephanie. Hey. Oh. Hey, wonderful talk. Hey, Seeker, and hello, yeah. friends. Yeah. <laughs> this is a wonderful talk, so truly Thank enjoy you. it. Uh, Stephanie, I want to uh, so dig in. Hey, you can see from the background where he is. He's <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, <laughs> from MIT. Uh, so, Stephanie, I want to dig into the question about uh, fibrotic uh, encapsulation. Yeah. Uh, you didn't uh, touch too many details. This is actually a challenge both for bioelectronics, actually more broadly for all implanted uh, uh, you know, materials and the devices. Right. Now, uh, uh, in our current design, so uh, your design and actually probably most of the design in the field, uh, even though we make the structure flexible, but the cells and tissues on a cellular level will still see this uh, uh, you know, metallic electrode. Right, that's a, a dramatic difference from the inert environment uh, for these uh, tissues. Uh, now, uh, is this, does it make sense, uh, you know, to modify those uh, electrode uh, locally? For example, I see you are working on coatings nowadays as well, uh, so that uh, you know we can uh, truly enhance this, uh, you know, uh, biocompatibility from a material level. There, instead of make the whole structure into, you know, something, uh, you know. A uh, 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 tissue-like material, but uh, uh, working on the interface. Yeah. Uh, is that a reasonable idea, or do you have other, you know, insights towards this uh, uh, grand challenge for this field? Uh, and then a follow-up, secondary question. Now you've been do done great job on uh, spinal core. Uh, I think a uh, uh, lower hanging fruit is a peripheral uh, nerves, right? Stimulation, recording. Uh, but I haven't seen works from your group yet. Uh, I want to know why. <laughs> So these are the two questions. <laughs> okay, so foreign body reaction. So indeed, uh, this is not something I touched upon, mostly because all the devices I've presented today are surface devices. So devices that we gently position at the surface of the nervous system, but we're not penetrating the system. So uh, the, the device, whether it's the ABI, so the audio, audio the auditory implant or the spinal cord implant, where actually the device is sitting on the spinal cord on the dura mater. And we've done some tests. Uh, the initial work on the dura was actually subdural, where the device was at the very surface of the spinal cord. And there we had actually very little fibrotic response. Um, so that was, uh, that was good. But I think because we matched the mechanical property of the dura, because we're, we're basically substituting the, du the natural dura mater by, with our implant. Now, when you penetrate the tissue, it's a complete different story. Um, and here, I, I, I gave you some numbers in terms of the elasticity, especially with this MR elasticity scan, where you see that white matter, gray matter differ. Um, and actually, if you, if you look at the literature, this is even conservative, saying that this is 1.5 kilopascal in general. Actually, a lot of there's here and there some papers say, seem to say that also the, the tissue is actually even small, uh, softer than that. And so that means that when you insert a device, even if it's in the megapascal range like the probes we have at the moment, most likely this is going to appear extremely stiff to the cell. Um, and uh, at the, so I, I believe we need to go smaller in terms of elasticity. So the approach you have with the hydrogel, et cetera, I think this is, a, this is something we need to, to, to do. The challenge there is actually then a trade-off between uh, compliance and geometry and volume. Because uh, at the moment, hydrogel, we don't know how to miniaturize them as much as pe people who are doing, you know, this micro thread of plastics and it turns out that if you have a miniaturized geometry, you know, threads that are one micron, couple of microns in diameter, actually they don't trigger that much foreign body reaction. So it's really a trade-off between volume and compliance, I think. And, I, and as of today, I, um, I don't think there is one route that is better than the other for fully implantable system. And, uh, and one, uh, one reason is because we also don't understand very well how the neurons themselves actually behave. There's no real 
fine, with high resolution measurement of the mechanics of the brain in situ. Because what you do with MR elastography, you know, the voxel are tens of micron in volume, so it's really big. Um, so that's, uh, so I think, uh, yes, we have to keep exploring uh, using soft material, but I think in parallel, we need to really explore how to machine them. Because as the, the more material you push into the tissue, the more trauma you're actually inducing. Um, and your second question on peripheral nerve interfaces. Now we do have also activities. So actually back in Cambridge, that was primarily the work I was doing on peripheral nerve for regeneration. Uh, and now with the, we have a, a couple of projects and uh, upcoming publication around uh, using optogenetic and the, and the peripheral nerve in the context of pain. But this is not translational work. This is more in the mechanistic understanding of, of the pain mechanism. So stay tuned. I'll send you the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Paul Le Floche, s'il vous plaît. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Paul. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Harvard. I work on uh, encapsulation technologies and I had a chance to work with Jigong for a few years. Now I work with uh, Professor Liu. And my question is about penetrating electrodes in the context of uh, brain implants. So suppose that we can find a new elastomer that we can pattern that is reliable and so it can replace the materials that people are currently using, such as pyrrolein or such as polyimide as encapsulation. The implant is gonna become even softer than um, what you have shown right now because it's gonna be elastomer, it's gonna be uh, a few micron in thickness. My question is, how do you implant something mm -hmm. that soft in the brain, which is a gel-like material? So basically, how do you implant something that is as soft as jello in something that is jello? So this is uh, the uh, million dollar question, right? Um, so there are multiple approaches and I think there's other groups that are better positioned than mine uh, on this. But um, so what, uh, what people tend to do for this approach is to use a transient carrier. So something that, will, that, you will, that is stiff that you will use only for the insertion and then that you remove afterwards. So that's one approach. It's, it looks easy, but actually this is challenging, I think, because you need to find the right glue uh, and the right glue that dissolves at the, at the right rate so that you can remove the device without uh, removing everything. Um, some, there's a, yeah, you, you can think of local stiffening of your, of your, um, of, of, of your, of your probe. Uh, I think there's, again, this is one of these questions. There's not uh, a solution at the moment. There, you, you look at the, the literature, there's many, many approaches, but I don't think there is one that uh, people agree on that's the one. Uh, so I'm afraid I can't tell you. <laughs> this is what you should do because uh, <laughs> I, there's a question. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to, to know if you have any, any crazy idea about that, uh, because it, it's true that the softness that we want to achieve is it's actually- impossible. It's a wet noodle problem, yeah. So you need to have some sort of a transient uh, phase where you have so something needs to be stiff at the, at the time of implantation. Mm. Thank you. Jing Yue Hu. Uh, Tanya had a quick comment. Nan Shu uh, Lu is trying to get on, but somehow uh, she hasn't switched in. Uh, if you can help her. Uh She's in. Oh, she's in. is on the panel, yeah. Okay, but Jing here is next. Oh, okay. So, um, hi, Professor Lacoon. Uh, this is uh, Jing Ji. Uh, we met actually briefly, I guess, two years ago at uh, Gordon Research at Hishan. So when I was a graduate student with Wally Sobo Yeju at Princeton. So, uh, but now I'm working at Mayo Clinic um, as a postdoc researcher on biomaterials. So I really found your... Um, path to translational work, very inspiring. So, um, so I'm a mechanical engineer by training. So one, I guess like two questions I usually got from doctors, uh, like more general questions. First is the uh, shelf life of uh, the device. 
like uh, because they really like something off the shelf. Uh, they like something can be stored relatively long time that can be used as medical devices. So um, I was wondering if you could comment briefly on that. And uh, the second question would be the sterility, just in general, because when you insert something to the body, uh, the material has to be like sterile, maybe um, according to like FDA uh, procedures is and that. I guess it's a little bit different in the Euro in European countries, but uh, uh, that's another aspect because I think um, in your device, you have a uh, mixed, polymer and also metal. So sometimes I think like the when the polymers are sub subjected to like, for example, like e-beam, like um, mm -hmm. gas sterilization, their properties can change. So um, yeah, um, so I was wondering what is your approach on addressing those problems and uh, something like that, thank you. So thank you for the question. This is something I actually did not mention at all. I'll start with the second question on the sterility. We actually have done extensive test on the options for sterilization. And um, so going from autoclaving to ETO via plasma, et cetera. And uh, so currently we're using um, ETO as a, as, a, as a technique. So ethylene oxide uh, exposure as a, as a technique because this is one of the standard clinical techniques. But um, we actually have not seen many differences in the behavior of the device or in the performance of the device pre and post sterilization. Um, so the plasma option is also something we, we, we are considering at the moment, especially I know in the US that the ETO is becoming something that uh, people want to uh, gradually avoid. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Um, and so uh, this is, uh, this is we, that's why we're looking into, into plasma uh, as an alternative. One technique that is really not suitable, I think, for the type of, uh, of device we're developing is UV sterilization, because the UV would actually affect the elasticity of the surface of the device. And so in, in our context, this is not something we, this is really something we have to avoid. Okay, understood. And then, um, so then, of course, then all the device we're making that and the data have shown in particular in animal model, this was all the device were sterile at time of implantation, of course. Okay. Um, and then uh, the second um, question on the shelf life. So we have not had the, would say the opportunity to, to test shelf life. So usually we were still in the cycle where we fabricate and we use almost uh, within the, uh, the couple of weeks after or post fabrication. So we don't know yet the shelf life of these devices. But okay. this is a question that will come one day when uh, indeed uh, we, we reach the clinic. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guyang. Guyang Ma. So, uh, thank you for your talk. Nice talk, uh, uh, Professor Luck. I'm from. Um, Johannes Kebra University uh, from Linz, Austria. I'm from uh, Martin Kebra uh, group. And I have two questions. And the first one is about uh, the requirement of the artificial nerve, uh, I mean, mechanical stretchability. To me, that hard gel is, can be stretched to thousand, ton, uh, thousand percent percentage of the uh, this original. I mean, stretchability is uh, very high of hard gel. And uh, I, I don't know that uh, the requirement uh, of uh, artificial uh, nerve, so the stretchability, does the, it uh, require, uh, how, how much stretchability does it require? So the uh, overall, the stretchability in the body is fairly modest. So thousand of percent, except if you consider the development phase of the body, where there you have indeed, but it's not just stretching, actually there's also more um, added materials. But um, I think physiologically, I can't really think of, apart maybe from muscle fiber who really stretch 100%, uh, that the other type of tissue actually stretch that much physiologically, so not in, in the context of an accident or, or et cetera. So that's why we, when I, at some point I did say that we, we going translational, et cetera, you are also a bit more conservative in the sense that we are actually now, that's why most of the device we're characterizing is within a range of 
10, 20% deformation. We, we don't see the physiological need to go to such high deformation. So maybe for other application, you know, like uh, the bladder, the, this may actually, there you have complex uh, inflation and multi-axial deformation, but for neuro, I don't think we need to aim for such high deformability. Question about uh, your touch here as a nerve. Uh, I'm curious, uh, do you have a special treatment uh, between the uh, electrodes uh, with the hydrogen? I mean, I'm curious about the interface. Does we Leo, don't uh, use hydrogen. Hmm? We do not use hydrogen. But it, it, you don't we only use have it. plastic and elastomer and metal. I mean, uh, how about you use, uh, okay, then how about you use hydrogen? Have you think about use hydrogen uh, because it is softer? So if you use hydrogel, you need to make sure that you have some good bonding and then Jigang and uh, uh, other, others on the call here are more expert than I am to, to ensure the, uh, the bonding between materials. Uh, but actually we have very little ex experience with hydrogel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nanshu, Nanshu Lu. Thanks, Sigurd. Hello, Stephanie. Hello. This Hello. is uh, Nian Xu from uh, UT Austin. As you can see from my background, that's the UT Tower. Uh, so it's uh, great to listen to Stephanie's wonderful talk and uh, also uh, meeting with uh, so many uh, friends here. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, Stephanie, and I have uh, um, two related questions. So, um, uh, uh, First of all, actually, I have to thank you because uh, Sigurd and you brought Jigang into this uh, flexible electronics and uh, then uh, gave Jigang the courage to do some experiments in flexible <laughs> electronics and I benefited tremendously <laughs> from uh, this uh, field and also uh, Jigang's uh, uh, courage. Um, so, uh, and uh, Stephanie's career has uh, uh, inspired me a lot in terms of uh, um, uh, doing the translational work and really uh, find biomedical use of our flexible electronics. So thank you. And um, my, I also uh, really appreciate the framework you build for uh, doing the um, translational work from uh, materials to uh, production to um, uh, transducer uh, system integration and ultimately uh, validation. So you mentioned about the importance of uh, the reproducibility of devices and you uh, probably uh, struggled a lot but eventually succeeded with uh, uh, setting up a very reproducible small standard deviation process. I'm uh, very curious about uh, how you uh, went through this process and uh, became successful eventually. Did you involve industrial partner or um, how, uh, did you establish very uh, rigid protocols in your group? H how did you make that happen? That's my first question. And I'll ask the second one after this. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, no, we didn't reach out. So thank you very much for, uh, for your comment. Um, and uh, no, we did not reach out to industry because actually, to our knowledge, there's really no, these are not routine processing and, 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 and uh, in industry today. So we decided to just do it ourselves. And that took a lot of uh, effort, courage, resilience from one of my postdocs, uh, who really actually put this into place where you have systematic evaluation and check along every single step of the process that actually you have reproducibility. And that by doing this, actually you realize that not a single time you put the wafer at the same place or that you have your mask at the same. Uh... So now we actually are systematic in the way we do every step in the process flow. And that's how actually we, we've been able to increase. But this is extremely constraining because uh, you have, there's one protocol and you have to follow it, but that's the only way you can do to actually get your yield up. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I fully understand. And, and uh, maybe one, we have a little of a, a privileged environment as well here. So we're based in Geneva, which means we also have a clean room in Geneva, which is therefore used by fewer users than if we were, when we were in Lausanne. So where we have the main campus clean room. And so the machine we're using are actually also dedicated to the type of deposition we're doing and the type of polymer we're manipulating. So that certainly has helped a lot that there's very little cross-contamination. Yes, and also keep training uh, the new students and researchers to be able to follow the same protocol is uh, yes. oh, yeah. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Um, my second question is, um, because in uh, biomedical uh, engineering, we have uh, those uh, um, like long process, and you mentioned that uh, we have to be conservative. It's constrained by the nature of this kind of research. But in the meanwhile, we also come from the engineering world, and we appreciate innovation and uh, creativity and uh, disruptive technology, right? So um, in this kind of uh, uh, interfacing work, um, sometimes I struggle with balancing the two needs and two desires. Um, so I want to uh, listen to your thoughts and how you balance and uh, do beautiful work like this. So you're absolutely right. This is, you know, that's what I discovered in going into this field is that it's almost counter intuitive and anti engineering and exploration, right? Um, so the way we actually do it in the group is um, we basically, we have two, two direction of, of work. One part of the, of the lab is really focused on the translation. And then what we are aiming for is working really with the clinicians and advancing the therapy and learning through that. So the inputs then on the innovation and the technology then are, are more modest because they happened before, but we contribute differently by enabling novel therapies or novel use of, of the devices. But then I also have a big portion of the lab who is doing very exploratory work. And so where there we, it's primarily manipulation of novel materials and, and the preclinical evaluation of the devices. So we, we get the, the two line of, of research and only pick one for now to actually push it to the translation. And I'm not sure we'll do in many others. <laughs> Great. Yes, I am also uh, trying hard uh, to uh, push into the translational and uh, biomedical uh, clinical trials, but uh, it's really difficult. <laughs> I think you, you have to, it's, it's a very different approach as well to, this is maybe more philosophical, right, but um, to the, the, the routine publication rhythm that we may have. If you embark in this, you have to be prepared that for three, four years, there's zero paper. That's a, that's a reality. And mm -hmm. I think this is also a super hard challenge because of course, for the student, for the postdocs, the team who are embarking in this project, we need to value their work, right? Um, um, so here in, in Switzerland and in the PFL in particular, we have, you know, um, we benefit from very good support for that uh, re research, for that type of research in, in translational work. And so we can, we, we have various mechanisms for grants, et cetera, to, 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 to continue this work in the long term, uh, because this is not compatible with one grant, one project, and you move on. This is not, a, this is clearly not uh, this type of, of, of research. So here we are, I'm tremendously happy to be here in Switzerland where we have sustainable funding in some of these topics. Right, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Stephanie, uh, may I return to a detailed uh, technical question myself? Uh, uh, the question that came up, or oh, excuse me, Nanshu, did you have another question? No. Uh, at the, the, the question was the size a resolution of the electrodes in uh, soft bioelectronics. And for a long time, uh, 
and I think many people uh, still do, think more on how small can you make an electrode on soft matter, right? It's a fabrication problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there must be characteristic lengths uh, in that determine the reasonable spacing between electrodes. And I think the, the lengths are probably different between stimulation and recording. Uh, because in stimulation, you, you go in with large voltages. So that means there is some uh, ionic drift in, associated. But if you record, then you may only go out to the space charge layer associated with the electrode. Uh, so what phenomena uh, would you, if, you know, going back to David White's question about simple qualitative uh, uh, rules, which phenomena would you look at for, uh, say, minimum spacing of recording electrodes and minimum spacing of stimulating electrodes? Is it neural excitation or is it ionic drift? Uh, I don't know, I just, that's what I'm asking. You, you understand what I mean? Yeah, I think again for the, it, again, it also very much depends on what you want to, what you want to do, right? So ultimately, you, if for recording, if you want to, to listen to individual neurons, the electrode needs to be of the size of the neuron. Um, smaller maybe, but, uh, and also it's, it's also a question that may, uh, the answer may differ, the size may differ whether you're in the brain or in the peripheral nerves, because the anatomy, the structure, the nerve is very anisotropic, it's a cable structure in the brain, it's uh, intermingled uh, connections. Um, so that's also very, very different. But um, um, the, the highest density at the moment uh, is with the, what is called the neuropixel probe. This is a probe that is fully CMOS made at IMAC. Uh, and this is a penetrating probe. And I think they reach a thousand electrode. And I can't remember now off the top of my head the actual dimension, but I think it's of the order of tens of micron and the pitch of a similar, of a similar size. And that's roughly the size of the neurons that you will encounter on that line. Um, for the stimulation, I think it's really a matter of, comp you can calculate, you know, the resistivity of the medium and you can take the worst case scenario where it's actually just PB, just uh, the ionic environment. And, and, and then for a given electrode, you can define how much volume it will, it will reach. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for stimulation, you, I, you can, what is interesting is miniaturization if you want to do the two modes. Because in the miniaturization, if you want to have a lot of information collected from a small area and right in the middle, you can have one stimulating electrode. Then that, that's interesting because then you will get information for, from recording from all around the electrodes. Uh, but uh, having either just a high density for stimulation, I don't think this is useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except if you want to start doing steering or steering of the electrical field and the region where you want to stimulate, but this becomes more, uh, even more challenging. So yeah, rule of thumbs, I think as, as we reach the size of the individual neuron, I think already that would be good. But what we realized when I talked also with the, um, neuroscientist and, and, and clinician, etc., is actually already with the number of electrodes, they don't know what to do with it. Yes. You know? <laughs> so this is good to, to, to think of one to one, but at the end of the day, if you have, you know, a hundred electrodes and in the end they just use five and with that, with five electrodes, the patient is able to, I don't know, move an artificial limb, maybe that's enough. Yeah, so, it's interesting in large area electronics, I'm still in this. Uh, you run into the same problem because the idea is you have, you could put a million sensors over some square meters. Uh, and uh, first it goes into signal compression. That's what you'll have to do also at the end. You can put in electrodes, but the, you have to have some IC Absolutely. down the, the probe. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, you run very 
quickly into the modern fields of AI. Uh, uh, even yeah. in, even in, in your case, where you are actually working with relatively small number of signals, but there's a complex time sequence. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now, this is something I did not mention at all, but I think um, I very much believe in hybrid system. So where you may have the electrodes that are much more biocompatible in their design aspect. And then we do need the electronics some not so far away that you can position in an area that is not so specific, not prone to inflammatory response or et cetera, but onto which you have computation. Mm -hmm. Because even with an array that of electrodes you position at the surface of the brain that has 36 or 64 electrodes, this is already massive amount of information, especially for recording. And then doing onboard computation is actually going to also help very much on the telemetry side, because one bottleneck at the moment is data transfer. You know, you have the, uh, the uh, one electrode array that is used today at the clinic, it's that Utah array, which is 100 electrodes. And at the moment, there's still no system that are fully implantable that can uh, uh, record from those 100. It's, it's still connected to a head stage. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the, uh, the, the flow of data that, uh, that are needed and the processing. So there's a, an enormous amount of opportunity, I think, on the EE side, purely the, the engineering uh, of the of the chip and the pros and the firmware on the chip or the software on the chip. Uh, uh, please, uh, anyone in the audience, you have a question? Oh, Ivan has a question. Ivan Minev. So hi, this is uh, Ivan Minev, University of Sheffield. Uh, Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, this is a, a wonderful talk, and, and it's and it's really great to see uh, uh, your la your latest work, um, uh, which I've also so been following also in in the, in the literature. But uh, so your your strategy and in, in your framework for translation, especially, I, I think it's very interesting. And in this uh, um, in this platform that you built for for testing the implants in vitro, um, in as much as possible in an environment that is as much as, as possible uh, 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 in a vivo mimicking environment. So th the question I have is, is how do we persuade the, uh, the regulatory bodies that, that, that this is something that can now speed up the process and, and, and reduce the number of animal trials that we do? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's what I hope very much is that uh, if more people actually start embracing such a framework, that uh, we will have fewer constraints in getting these, these tests validated. It still doesn't um, prevent you or avoid the in vivo part, right? You still need to, to do the, the real in vivo validation. But actually, there's a lot of progress, lots of debugging, if you, if you want, that you can do through this system. Um, so how to convince the regulatory body, I don't know. But I think by accumulating evidence is definitely one thing that, uh, that will work. So if we're, several of us are actually embracing this approach, uh, hopefully this will, uh, this will help. And in multiple contexts as well. You know, we've done for spinal cord, but certainly you know, it, it can be done with other organs or even other parts of the of the nerve of the nervous system. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again, Stephanie. Uh, in anyone in the audience, do you still have a question? Oh, please go ahead. Hi, this is Fabio Cicola from uh, Polytechnic in Montreal. Hi, Stephanie. Very Hello. nice talk. <laughs> and very inspiring. So my question is, uh, uh, you quickly showed the impedance uh, recording on the uh, bio-inspired uh, aging. And uh, if you can comment a little bit on this, I didn't see very well how the impedance evolved over time. So what we do uh, in the system is uh, we always characterize, we do the full impedance spectrum. So from uh, the regular, you know, low frequency, 10 Hertz to uh, mega. And then we also, so we had multiple tests, right? So we had implants with just the electrode and we let the electrode sit mm. in the environment while the other half of the electrode, we also uh, electrically pulsed them. Like stimulation. 
like electrical stimulation, ah. like they would be used. So then we compare if one is aging and the other is not, or if, so this allowed us to actually sort of decouple also effect. What is the pure uh, exposure to saline solution? Then you can combine just saline, then saline plus motion, then saline plus motion plus electrical. Okay. And, and it's once we have this combination that then we systematically compare the impedance at the various frequencies. And we can then look at where the drift, if there is a drift and where it comes from. Fun. And what, yeah. what we found is actually the initial techniques that we had with just the, the standard thin microcrite gold that was our initial starting point. We found that actually we had much, uh, some cracking that appeared in the complete uh, sort of a, almost like a spiral that was following the torsion that was imposed by the, 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 the motion of the, of, the, of the cervical. And so when we, of course, there the impedance is actually increasing, especially the high frequency one, which corresponds to the interconnect. So it's not so much what we see in all of these technologies that it's not so much our electrode coating that, uh, that age, of course, if you do super long uh, pulsing, this will start corroding eventually, just like regular platinum does. Yes. But uh, this technique is mostly meant to actually look at the high impedance, the high frequency side, which is how our electrical conductor, the DC part, in fact, will, will behave with the repeated mechanics. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thanks again. Any more questions? Oh, Martin. You know, I have to unmute. Hi, Sigurd. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Hello. Wonderful talk. Very, very much love to listen to you and especially to see the progress. And I know that it's super hard to do all this transnational work. But let's get to the question because we are on this for a while. So, of course, um, most people focus at the beginning at electrodes because they're, at least in terms of the electrical complexity, the easiest that you can realize. But let's look beyond, you know, a couple electrodes. Um, and I have a couple of questions to this. The first question is, and you already mentioned it, that there are CMOS chips that can record a couple, you know, dozen sites, and there is massive amount of data involved when you look at these signals. So first of all, do we need to make such types of electronics soft in one day in order to have like implantable devices that can address more electrodes, you know, to have multiplexing and such things, which means we would need transistors. But more fundamentally, do we actually need this? So how many electrodes do you think would we realistically need in order to get meaningful information? I mean, I'm sure this depends on what kind of tissue and what kind of nerves you're looking at, but can you just give us your ideas on, on what you think? Yeah, I, so I sort of changed my mind along the way. So when I started, uh, I was very much convinced that we needed the transistors on site. So uh, at the electrode uh, site. And I think, I still think this is important if you want to do um, high quality signal processing, because the, the sooner, the quicker you, um, you amplify your recorded signal, the better, right? Because you have less chances that you, you get parasitics uh, and noise, et cetera. Um, but then when I, when then given the work we, we do now around more therapeutical application, it looks like the, the power that you need in terms of computing is such that it would be difficult to actually do better than what we can do with CMOS at the moment. And so, again, I don't think there's a one solution for all application, but uh, I, I, at the moment, I can't see that we're not going to use CMOS in the next generation of this type of implant because it's just, you know, especially with the upcoming, you know, machine learning uh, embedded into some of these, uh, the FPGA, et cetera, where you can do in situ, you know, computation and modulate the computation in, in real time. I think this is, uh, this is important. Uh, but that doesn't mean that for some, other, some application where maybe you need less computing power, that actually having the electronics uh, uh, and the transistor close by is, um, is not important. 
to, uh, we've lost Martin. I must have upset him. <laughs> Again, Stephanie, more questions? Alexandra? Uh, Martin is back. Hold on. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. It's, you know, our daycare is off because of Corona. So yeah, I have but to yeah, no problem. Every five minutes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I could listen to you at least, but I had to disappear to open the door. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, that's yeah, okay. I, I, basically, yeah. I basically agree with you. I also think at the moment it's too complex to get seamless on board. And also, as you said, you're, you're actually restricted in the number of materials that you can use because you also need to think about medical um, quality polymers even, and then not even to talk about semiconductors and things like this. So, but, but again, this is where the more conservative side of me will, will tell you. On the other hand, I mean, as academics and as scientists, we have to explore new material and new device designs. That's, uh, this is for sure. So actually bringing, you know, mechanical compliance in semiconductor material is also something that I found very interesting. And uh, we may use this as new way, new means for transducing as well. So, I would certainly so what is your to... thought then on this, um, um, like mostly organic semiconductors, you know, George Maliaris and folks are pushing a lot for PDOT as an interface to the cells. And... Yeah, I think this is a very, I mean, very good approach too, right? And there the benefit, it's coming back to the question I had before, you know, going from the ionic to the electronic world. And I think the organic uh, conductors and semiconductors are then best positioned to be this transduction to do this transduction. Um, so I think there, what may be scary for the, in the translational context is that you have so many options that by the time you get one approved, it's gonna take some time. Uh, you know, PDOT is certainly one of the most advanced uh, material for uh, clinical, clinical tra translation, but it's, uh, as far as I'm aware, it's it's still not implemented in a device that is FDA approved. And, or maybe Fabio has a counter well, argument. Uh, no, 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 I just had an information a while ago that uh, it uh, had been approved for some uh, health related uh, device. Yeah, but it's, we have to be very cautious there because first of all, we can, a material by itself cannot be approved. Yeah, a device. Well, a a device material, yeah implemented in a specific device is approved. So then it really depends also on what is the application and the context. So yeah, I've heard that story too, that there is some device that has some PDOT, uh, but uh, it's not yet the, the, the norm. And I think hopefully this will open up, but uh, I think um, this is where it's very, very challenging, right? Because with the organic electronics, you have so many options that uh, finding the right uh, configuration is, is going to be a, a challenge. But as for people who do biomaterials, right? If you, if you look at uh, people who do uh, heap replacement and, and, and so on, there's also quite a nice collection of materials that are being introduced. So that tells us that we need to continue and search for a material that have substantially better properties than the others. Uh, yeah, it's Alexandra Roots. Uh, uh. Hi, Stephanie. Um, this is Alex uh, from University of Cambridge. Um, thanks for the great talk and thanks for the, the discussion afterwards. My question is about uh, chronic indwelling implants. Uh, so at the beginning of your talk, you uh, showed the hermetic packaging, these large metal uh, encasings of devices. And at the end, you had mentioned the need for longer term uh, encapsulation materials. So I was wondering if you could um, give your comments about what you believe to be um, the challenges associated with the future uh, of, of these these sorts of issues in bioelectronic devices and maybe some promising approaches. I know for, for me, I think about th these are very thin materials and organic materials have poor um, gas and water permeability than some of the other materials that have been traditionally used. And I'd like to hear about your thoughts about this and, and maybe other, some other things. Yeah. No, I think this is, um, so two things I really didn't talk about in the talk is uh, connectors and encapsulation. And uh, we also spent a lot of time on, 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 on both of these aspects. And uh, encapsulation strategy is something that is relatively 
there's a lot of options. And if I, if I look at all the bulk of the work that has been done in the fin film electronic domain, especially for OLED, etc., there's actually a very large uh, pool of material we can try and, and explore. So I think somewhere in there, there must be a, the right combination. Where I think gets a little bit more complicated is that uh, there we, we actually also not only need the hermeticity, but we need to maintain the hermeticity upon motion. And uh, hermeticity is usually better ensured with material that are grown at high temperature and very dense. Uh, which is then not very compatible with the polymers or the organics material that we, we've just discussed. And so here at the moment is really what strategy, there's, it's an open question. Is, I, I, I think that if we want to bring the active electronic closer to the, so get rid of the titanium can, we actually need to find a way of, of doing fin film encapsulation or a mixture between fin film and more some standard silicone packaging and so on. That's, uh, that's, that's clear. But as far as I know, this is not yet, uh, again, an approved or an agreed upon strategy. You know, there's some, the group of, again, John Rogers, they've done a lot of work with the thermal silicon oxide. I think this is one super promising route, uh, but maybe it's not the only one. Maybe you can explore other, other, uh, other layers, other things. You know, Xi Gang has a credo currently. I didn't know that. He says uh, uh, hard materials uh, are needed. Soft materials will never be hermetic. Xi Gang, isn't that true? How about you mix the two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been, I've been speculating about this for years now. But the, uh, yeah, you know. so uh, uh, I can't, uh, there's no hand raised on the screen that I can see. So that's why I keep asking whether the Ivan is raising his hand. Hmm? Ivan has been raising his physical hand. I, I, yes, but I think Tank has been doing that for much longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Seeker, probably you are uh, my, yeah, my screen, probably on the second screen, <laughs> page of a screen of your side. Yeah, uh, yeah no problem. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, for this wonderful talk and uh, bringing the frontiers of the soft neural interfaces to a uh, webinar, EML webinar audience. And also bring, uh, uh, bringing back the uh, good memories we had a long time ago. <laughs> uh, Jigang and, uh, was uh, doing this uh, Twittering uh, a few days ago uh, and actually referring to the, the paper we were uh, wrote, uh, writing together. Uh, so uh, I have two follow-up comments and uh, one question. And you know, uh, EML webinar series, actually we have a lot of uh, uh, viewers uh, who are early stage uh, researchers, PhD students, postdocs, and also the uh, new faculty members. And uh, in the past uh, webinars, I, I typically ask questions uh, out of my curiosity. But I actually received quite some feedback from those early stage researchers that they appreciate the certain questions I asked the speaker that they couldn't ask. So I tried to tailor my comments and uh, the question uh, for uh, those people. Uh, the first comment is, um, thank you for sharing this uh, collaboration among us and uh, uh, the importance of uh, that collaboration for your career. I think the, uh, the comment I want to make is that the, the power of the collaboration, especially this uh, quality interdisciplinary collaboration cannot be overstated. And uh, you showed a very good example that uh, how this early stage collaboration did for your uh, future uh, later on the career development. I, I think I benefited that a lot as well. Uh, so Sigurd, I, I don't know if you still remember that when Jigang's group moved uh, from uh, uh, Princeton to Harvard, I left behind uh, for one more semester, right? Yeah. So to wrap up our collaboration, I, I, got, I was privileged to join your group for half a year, which is really, really eye-opening. And I, I benefited a lot from that. And uh, I would like to further extend my appreciation to both of you and also Jigang for this collaboration also helped launch my uh, academic so 
for for our uh, PhD student, uh, uh, postdocs, and early stage researchers, and I would suggest you highly recommend you uh, reach out to the colleagues across the the hallway or across the the street or even across the nation for collaborations. Okay. Second uh, second comment I want to make is uh, a simple and solid idea can have very long lasting value. I learned this from Qigong and who is a master of this philosophy. And remember in the, those early years, um, Qigong and I, we were sitting in his office, two theoreticians turned rookie experimentalists using a pair of scissors and a piece of a, yep. a letter sized paper were cutting serpentines and doing the experiment uh, in his office. And uh, such a simple but solid idea, as you can see in Stephanie, your uh, presentation, I really enjoyed that slide that you showed this early stages idea and the further application of these ideas uh, in uh, many of your projects uh, later on. And it's great to see that this simple and solid idea later on uh, adopted and also adapted by many people and uh, uh, in many areas. And uh, actually, I myself, from time to time, I revisit this idea as well. Indeed, recently, uh, we picked up this idea, used uh, 3D printing to print, uh, to make the stretchable battery for, uh, to, uh, for stretchable electronics. And believe it or not, <laughs> right before your uh, talk, finish your talk, I received an email on the paper on that, it was just accepted. <laughs> Thank you for bringing the good luck. So the good collaboration not only give you the, you know, uh, give you a lot of things and also a good luck. Yeah. So here's a question I, for you. Um, actually, Nanshu asked the, uh, the similar question, but I want to uh, uh, ask it in a, a different uh, way. Now, I like the idea that in the, in the, in the end of your slide, you show that you, you aim to drive the scientific research to translational uh, applications. And I know that uh, you set the goal in the early stage of your career. Now, if you look back to your very early stage, for example, when you started in Cambridge, when you try to proceed along this line in this route, so what is the biggest challenge you encountered at that stage? And how did you overcome that? So thank you very much uh, for for this uh, this comment, and I also very dearly value the time from uh, from Princeton with you, with Ji Gang, with Sigurd. You know, with this endless discussion that I still been traumatized by Ji Gang, who did not believe I could do such a vocal. <laughs> so <laughs> this is something that I, I will remember forever. Um, but um, I think uh, so fairly from I would say from the Fairly early on, I, I've always valued and been curious with uh, interdisciplinary work. So I guess this is something that is, uh, in a way, I can, I could, if I can say that, I have built in. I'm, I, 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 I do not stay in just one discipline. I have to, to look and work with, uh, with people from other fields. Um, but this is a... I think at the time, maybe this was a bit challenging because uh, you, it's not common that you are trained in one discipline and then how do you then sh shift or you appear as someone who knows a little bit about this and that, but you're not the expert. But I think the key stands in, um, in really demonstrating that there's significant added value in working together and bridging out fields. And I think this is what we've done from the start, you know, doing the electronics and the, uh, the mechanics in Princeton. And this is what I've tried to then do all along. And um, I think uh, you need to find people who also think this way. So uh, I think I've been uh, in a way lucky in uh, also my more bio or neuro or um, clinical uh, part, uh, colleagues is because they are also believing in in the value of interdisciplinary work. So I think that's, uh, that's important. If you want to move forward in interdisciplinary research, you have to actually team up with people who understand and will make the effort to meet you halfway. Because one big challenge is clearly the language. 
And, uh, and one thing I actually did when I arrived in Cambridge was to register to the first year med, med, uh, med school course in neuroscience to get the jargon right. Because after two meetings, I could not get any single of the definition from what my neuroscience colleagues were talking about. So then I, I took the class for, for a year and then it fits. I, I'm not a neuroscientist, will never be, but at least there's some vocabulary I can now understand. And I think this is something that I, I, I like very much in the center we have here is because our, our colleagues who are in the life sciences are actually making the effort in understanding what are our language and what are our challenges. And this way, once you understand the, the rules from both sides, then uh, you, can, you can make progress. Tanya has another question thing. Tanya Ratva. Hello, um, Tanya again. Um, thank you for that. I, I just had a follow up question, which is a bit technical. Um, so you mentioned um, a bit before in your, tech, uh, in your questions like, that you believe in hybrid systems where you have um, a CMOS attached to uh, the, neuroplast, uh, the, the neuro part of your devices. So the devices that um, are actually like interfacing the brain. But at the same time, there's been work that's been done by Yuri and uh, Pascalis, where they're trying to implement neuromorphic devices that act as an interface to actually record and um, deliver uh, medication at the same point. Could you briefly kind of like, you know, explain a bit about how you feel about having CMOS technology being attached to your neuroprosthetics versus neuromorphic devices being there and being able to actually deliver and um, um, signal like both way closed loop systems in your devices. Yeah, I think one does not inc exclude the other, right? Mm. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, neuromorphic computing is definitely a, a, an important trend nowadays. You know, it's at the end, it is CMOS based. Um, and so uh, you can uh, it can probably be combined uh, with the, with the, some of the approach we're doing, but uh, I don't think one excludes the other. Well, and uh, multiple functions, so, sorry, multi modalities is also something that uh, we I didn't talk about. I focused on electrodes, but with the technology we're developing, we can also look at closed loop system where you can deliver drugs using microfluidics. You can deliver light, integrating light sources. So it's actually, there's, again, not in the translational domain, but uh, definitely at reach um, of, in the preclinical evaluation. Uh, oh, Ivan. Ivan is asking another Thank question. You. Thank you, Tanya. <clears throat> so, Stephanie, a, a, a clinical question. What would be uh, the first clinical indication that will be treated with the <laughs> implants? Um, it's, it's not clear yet because uh, as, we are, as we want to enter indeed the clinic, we cannot aim for a chronic device, for a lifelong device because we don't have the, this will, we won't get the approval. So the first approval that we will have is, is something intraoperative or short term. So uh, application we're looking at now is, is actually brain interfaces, so ECOG type of devices. But uh, yeah, that's uh, in the exploratory phase. So that would be epilepsy then, I guess. We'll see. <laughs> so I suggest Stephanie has been on the screen for almost three and a half hours now. Oh, really? Oh, good and, God. <laughs> and I know from previous speakers that <laughs> They tell me afterwards I'm dead. <laughs> so you look pretty alive, but who knows what is actually going on with you. I think this was a fantastic uh, presentation and a fantastic question and answer session. I'm, I, I trust my own opinion. I'm so fascinated by the field because it's truly mind stretching. You, you, to understand what is going on, you have to understand so many different things uh, that, uh, which always for me is a, uh, was a challenge to go into other areas and find out what you're doing. But what is even an art is what you are doing. You are able to present it in an integrated way uh, and you're able to actually understand what everybody is doing. 
to some degree in the entire line. So congratulations for your brain, Stephanie. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you very Excellent. much. Thanks thank, for having thank, me. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Hi, everyone. Thank you, thank, uh, thank you Shigang. Mm -hmm. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. It was thank really you. nice uh, seeing you all, and I hope we will have another opportunity soon. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so you. Do I need to turn off something or what? The... That's fine. I can, uh, I'll make an announcement <laughs> for the next uh, week's uh, uh, EMI webinar, then we, uh, we, we will be all set. So okay. coming up next Wednesday at the same time, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time in U.S., we'll have a uh, first a trilogy of uh, EMI webinar. It will be presented by three professors, uh, Pedro Rice in EPFL, and uh, Basil Andali from uh, 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 Equal uh, Polytechnic in France, and Ethan uh, Greenspan from University of Toronto on the trilogy of God by a mathematician, a mathematician, and a computer scientist. Uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you.